Minutes, please. Mrs. Bealey? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Join me in the pledge. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We need to leave a seat for Mary. She'll be joining us um, a little later. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Fair enough. Okay, moving on. Moving on to our workshop session. Um, oh, actually, sorry, public comment on agenda items. How could I forget? Um, so we will have public comment on proficiency-based education and also on any new business items. The first reading of um, school board policy IDR, which are the start times for um, those who don't know. Okay, I will speak extra loud. Thank you. Move this up, hopefully. Um, so if you want to come up for public comment, you can start lining up right here. So before we begin, I just want to say we have a full agenda tonight. So. Um, we were unable to get to new business from our March 1st meeting, which is why you see some of the meeting minutes here um, tonight in this workshop. And um, we extended public comment on Monday night's meeting to allow um, all that wanted to speak the opportunity to do so. So I need to stay firm on the 30 minutes tonight so we can get through business. We have guests who have joined us here tonight. Um, I understand that seems frustrating, but please um, know that if you've emailed us, we have read them. and. Um, that's just as good as public comment here, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we will try to get through as many people as we possibly can in those 30 minutes, so please um, keep comments to three minutes or less. The standard um, things you hear us always say, um, agenda items only, out of respect for other speakers and differing opinions in time, we ask that you hold your applause. Um, please no comments on specific people, and all comments should be directed to the chair. Please state your name and address as you start. Hi, my name is Sonia Serafin. I live at 5 Rikers Drive. It's a great neighborhood in the Halloween season, so come by. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you for presenting a compromise option. Um, hundreds of us have been asking for that for the past 12, 13 months. So I greatly appreciate it and felt very hopeful after the last meeting. Um, I wanted to just clarify my understanding of why the compromise plan will be a positive change for the community and I took this from what Julie had to say so I just <coughs> want to make sure I understood everything correctly. Um, the high school and middle school would start at 8, primary schools and now Wentworth would start at 8.50. The doors would open 20 minutes early to allow if anyone needed an earlier drop off which I thought was great. It sounded like some of the bus issues are resolved and may actually, um, we may have shorter duration of bus rides. That was my understanding. So I thought that was a great win. My son will be riding with Julie's daughter, so we are one of the longer buses, but he likes to show off his Pokemon card, so that's okay. Um, it sounded like with the compromise, no high school or middle school would have to leave school earlier for activities such as sports games. It sounds like the aftercare challenges may be less since older siblings or older kids in the neighborhood would be home. I know my husband was at the community services at 9 a.m. on Wednesday after the snowstorm. Was that? Gosh, I'm a little confused with the days. But the second day, and we are already waitlisted, unfortunately, but he didn't even ask about it. He's a little out of the loop <laughs> with things. And he just said, okay. And they just said, but email. Um, the board and tell them you want the compromise plan because it might loose, loosen up some of the challenges. So I just want to let you know that community services sounds like they're for the compromise plan, though I don't want to speak for them. It sounds like the vocational program will be able to remain as is and they're a vibrant part of the school community as well, so I was happy to hear that. 
I'm not familiar with this, but RISE crew and AE advisory times can remain in the morning, which it sounds like that's something the high school worked diligently on, and that's the best learning period for kids. It sounded like the high school students that spoke, including the two board members in front of us, thank you very much, um, also support the compromise plan. One of the things I was most concerned about is my son achieving his 11, 12 hours of sleep, and he will be able to do that with the compromise. It sounds like none of the youngest will be waiting in the dark for the bus, and that the oldest kids, that will be reduced by about 80%, um, the ones at the middle school and high school. And I just want to say, you know, from my professional experience in human resources, that some of the best well-meaning implementations aren't always successful if the employees don't feel empowered, listened to, valued. And I think many of us have felt that way for a long time. That's why you've seen a drop in morale, less productivity, potentially higher turnover. So hopefully with the compromise plan, some of those areas will improve as well amongst the school community and all of you. Thank you for your time. Diana Nelson, uh, 5 Wedgwood Street. And this board knows how I feel about start times, but tonight I am not here to speak on my own behalf. I am here to speak on behalf of nearly 1,100 parents, residents, students, and community members who have signed a petition to respectfully ask that the Board of Education please consider a compromise when it comes to start times. Um, and certainly, while not a legal document, the petitions uh, served as a useful place for everyone to unite their voices and have them be amplified and hopefully increase our chances of being heard. So I have copies, uh, should the board want to see uh, the petition itself, um, that I'll read it for the group and the board. While we fully support the leadership's intention behind adjusting school start times, we strongly believe that the proposed <coughs> schedule is too severe and will create multiple problems for every age group. The age group K through five that requires the most sleep will get less. Bus routes will begin at 7 a.m. and last up to 50 minutes or more each way. That is something that the board had repeatedly said likely wasn't going to happen before we voted on this plan back in 2017. Safety of our kids certainly is paramount and having K through five kids walking to and waiting for their bus before sunrise is not acceptable. Lengthened bus rides will last more than 50 minutes for various sco schools and students, not just for those living the greatest distance away. Children of working parents will spend more time in aftercare and away from home. This is a financial problem for parents and a sacrifice that we should not ask our youngest students to make. Athletic teams for students could be merged so that they could continue to play other schools in other districts. High school athletes could require early release on game days, which would put a strain on instructional time. Neighboring municipalities have used Scarborough as an example of what not to do as they implement their own schedule changes. Many of the promises made by the school board have been broken and major questions still do remain unanswered. Because of this, we find it imperative that the decision be reevaluated. While we fully respect the board's intention of striving to secure ideal sleep cycle needs for all students, this change is so extreme and unintended problems are being created for all age groups. We do respectfully ask that the Board of Education reopen the discussion and revisit a compromised solution. Thank you so much. Good evening, Courtney Jasek, One Edgewater Road. I am here tonight to speak of my opposition in the start times for the 2018-19 school year. Years ago, I was a five-year-old entering the Scarborough school system as a kindergartner at Blue Point School. Back then, kindergarten group went just for a half a day. 
And my thoughts are, why was that? And perhaps at that age, young children cannot handle such a long school day. I have been hearing an awful lot about the research that shows starting the uh, oldest students later is beneficial, but what about the beneficial aspect for the youngest? What about the youngest children in this community who are entering kindergarten, whom are still sleeping past 7 a.m.? What about the youngest children who still have tantrums in the morning over their clothing or the way their socks were put on? The children of this age group are not easily rushed, which makes getting them up, fed, dressed, and out the door that much harder. The change in start times for the new school year has the youngest children of the community starting at 8 a.m. What's even worse is that the bus schedule is scheduled to pick up my five-year-old at 7 a.m. Some members of the board have felt that us parents that do not like the board the bus schedule uh, dropping our, our children off is the other option. But I wonder, what does that say about the people in the town who pay the taxes for the buses that our children will not be able to use? Last spring, members of the board made reference to uh, the parents that the youngest children would not be impacted significantly with the changes. Members of the board did not believe that the youngest children of the community would have to be up, fed, and dressed and ready to go at 7 a.m., but they also thought that 90% of our young children would be picked up at 7.30 a.m. or 7.45 a.m. with wiggle room. The Scarborough Board of Education voted on these start times before the bus audit had come out, so that being said, I am personally requesting that each board member take into consideration the current bus audit, which is now going to negatively impact the youngest children of our community. I am asking for a compromise, a compromise so that the changes would benefit, the changes that are gonna benefit the oldest would not impact the youngest so significantly. As a Scarborough High School graduate, I know as a community we are better than this. And I stand here today because I believe that. Um, I believe that a compromise would slowly begin to heal this town for all the students, teachers, parents, and other members of the community. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kim Sawyer, and I reside at Seven Lawton Circle. My daughter is eight years old and is a second grader at Blue Point School. Like many children her age, she requires 11 to 12 hours of sleep per night. Her bedtime is at 8 p.m. and I literally have to wake her up at 7.45 every morning to be at the bus stop by 8.30. I'm concerned about the health of our youngest school citizens if the board moves forward with the start times currently set for the next school year. I was very encouraged to hear the outline of the new compromise plan at the meeting on Monday and I would like to request that our board move forward with this plan. Thank you. I'm Christopher Modell. I'm a board certified pediatrician. I live at Seven Evergreen Farms Road. I have two children in the Scarborough Public School Systems, one at Eight Corners and one at Wentworth. I wanted to again publicly express my support for the originally proposed changes to start times. I do not support the recently proposed compromise. The health complications for the middle and high school students are a direct result from their chronic sleep loss. Many students will try to counteract this chronic sleep loss by napping after school, drinking caffeine, taking stimulants, and sleeping in on the weekends to make up for their accrued sleep debt. The AAP specifically addresses this in their policy statement saying these measures do not restore optimal alertness and are not a substitute for regular sufficient sleep. To see the maximal benefit of changing the start time for the middle and high school students, it has to be after 8.30. The reason for this is the research has shown that by moving the start time to after 8.30, these students can achieve on average an additional hour of sleep. This equates to five extra hours of regular sleep per school week. Once one research study including 9,000 students at eight public high schools found that the percentage of students sleeping eight hours or more per night were dramatically higher in schools with later start times. 33% of schools that started at 7.30, sorry, 33% of students were achieving eight hours of sleep if their school started at 7.30, whereas 66% were, 
were achieving over eight or more hours of sleep if it started after 8.55 p.m., or 8.55 a.m. In my opinion, the proposed compromise falls short of the national recommendations and fails our students for its intended purpose. I understand the board is in a challenging place and has heard arguments both for and against the start time changes. I also understand that to best achieve the start time recommendations from the AAP, the board and the superintendent had to flip the start time schedule. Some parents have raised concerns about the impact an earlier start time could have on our younger children's sleep. Most often cited in these concerns are the sleep requirements for our youngest students. The AAP official recommendation for ages three to five, five being our kindergarten group, is that they get 10 to 13 hours of sleep a day, including naps. Ages six through 12, the recommendations are for nine to 12 hours. Generally speaking, the younger the child, the more sleep they require. In my opinion, almost all of these children should be able to meet their recommended sleep requirements with an 8 a.m. start time. The other question being asked is, is the 8 a.m. start time unreasonable for our elementary schools? I argue that it is not. I see a number of benefits to our elementary learners. These include increased morning instructional time, which will allow teachers to better capture when these students are at their best for learning, fewer before school transitions, being the first group in the two-tier busing schedule will likely result in less delayed arrivals and allow elementary students to start the school day on time. Opportunities to participate in after-school activities or just be home from school before it's getting dark outside. Based on the comments provided by one of your elementary school principals on Monday, and they would likely agree with these benefits and even stated that they were looking forward to having their elementary students earlier. These sentiments were also similarly, similarly expressed by the Wentworth principal. As a school board, you have a unique opportunity to make a direct impact on the health and well-being of your students. I ask you to help be a solution to the current epidemic of insufficient sleep in our middle and high school students. Please implement a plan that has them starting school after 8.30. I am substantially too short for this microphone. Okay, my name is Caitlin Locasio King. I live at 14 Fraser Acres Lane. Um, the irony of who I'm speaking after is not lost on me. I don't have a prepared speech. I actually just stood there and wrote a few numbers down based off the science I was just told. So um, we moved here in 2014 for the sole purpose of the school district, and I am not exaggerating on that point. We lived in Auburn, Maine. Sorry, Auburn, less than ideal schools. We went to our realtor and said we only want a look at homes in Scarborough, Falmouth, and Cumberland. All we cared about was good school district. We have children ages seven, five, three, and one. So to say I'm invested in this issue is quite something. So I was just informed that for my kindergartner, ideal sleep range is 10 to 13 hours. I went to law school, not accounting school. So we're gonna go in the middle 12 because that's a whole lot easier for my math. So based off of where our pickup is, my children need to, will be picked up at 7 a.m. As uh, the superintendent said on Monday's meeting, plus or minus five minutes, anyone who lives in this town this year with the school bus knows that's more like 10, 20, 25, 30 plus or minus minutes, but we'll say five. So that's 6.55. Uh, like many in our area, off broad turn, my kids don't get picked up at the door. They get picked up at the end of our road. I am not complaining. It's a narrow road. I get it quarter mile for a five-year-old. My child will need to leave the house at 6.40 in the morning. Well, in order for my child to leave the house at 6.40 in the morning, he needs to get up, he needs to brush his hair, brush his teeth, eat breakfast, get dressed, coats, boots, jackets, you name it. So my kids need to wake up no later than 6 a.m. I was just informed they need 12 hours of sleep. So they need to be entering a REM cycle at 6 p.m. To enter a REM cycle at 6 p.m., they need to be put to bed, they need to brush their teeth. We read to them every night. I believe the school district encourages that. So my children need to be marching up the stairs at 5.30 p.m. to meet what I was just told. This is a <laughs> The reason I have avoided speaking at these meetings like the plague, I've been here, I didn't want to speak. I was moved to on Monday because I heard person after person stand up and speak about how younger parents don't want it for convenience and about the high school or sleep needs. What you're telling me is I need to put my kids to bed at 5.30 for their sleep needs. 
what you're telling a working parent who's in Portland until 5 o'clock, if they're lucky enough to get into aftercare or their sitter, you better break all the laws and speed home because if you pick them up at 5.30, they're late for bed. This isn't about convenience. It's about common sense. So I am... I'm asking that the route stay the same or go with the compromise. Hi, Ginny Newsy, 17 Nutter Way. Um, I'd like to speak about profici proficiency-based education. Um, I told you on Monday that I was a lifetime educator, and my field is foreign language, so I'm familiar with these with proficiency standards. Philosophically, I'm 100% behind them. That's what we should be doing. Um, recently, I've been concerned that Maine DOE seems to be tapping the brakes a little bit and pulling back. Um, the most recent reporting I've, I've heard um, on, I think it was MPBN, indicates that the state has not yet determined exactly what the proficiency standard would be for each grade level, even of math and English, which concerns me. Um, but I really wanted to, to say something tonight about college admissions, because I've heard a lot of discussion about whether a, a proficiency-based transcript with hurt, would hurt college admissions. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the New England Con Secondary School Consortium, which has come out with a statement on college admissions that people may or may not be familiar with. Um, and the title of this report is 74 New England Institutions of Higher Education State that Proficiency-Based Diplomas Do Not Disadvantage Applicants. So not all of the schools you're familiar with have signed this document, but many have. Um, and I think it's moving us in the right, the right direction. But there are two caveats in this document that I think it's really important for all of us to recognize as we go forward, um, and so I'll just read them. Students with non-traditional transcripts, including proficiency-based or competency-based, will not be disadvantaged. Colleges and universities simply do not discriminate against students based on the academic program and policies of the sending school, and here's the key, as long as those program and policies are accurately presented and clearly described. As long as the school profile is comprehensive and understandable, it clearly explains the rigor of the academic program, the technicalities of the school's assessment and grading system, and the characteristics of the graduating class, the admissions office will be able to understand the transcript and properly evaluate the strength of a student's academic record and accomplishments. In short, Schools use so many different systems for grading, blah, 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 um, that the system can only be properly understood when a transcript is accompanied by a comprehensive school profile. It needs to understand the, the applicant's academic accomplishments and abilities in context. So I have no philosophical issue with proficiency-based education. I think it's a great idea. But the fact of the matter is that the onus is on this district to replace what is a familiar transcript um, with narrative data and a lot of hard work up front before we switch to any different grading system that wouldn't disadvantage our students. Proficiency-based education will not disadvantage our students. In terms of learning, it should advantage them. but. There will be a lot of, and this is what I, this was the uh, drum I was beating it on Monday night that a few school buses might solve the the you know the problem that we we keep arguing about in terms of start times. There will need to be resources put into um, recreating how we grade, how we assess, how our teachers are trained, um, and that it, it just will require resources to make this big change. So I think we should do it, but the town is going to have to invest money to support these changes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road. Um, I appreciate the concern for our teenagers' well-being and their sleep requirements, and we've heard several doctors already testify about that, and I'm sure we'll hear more. However, studies conducted by the CDC, the American Academy for Sleep, the Sleep Science Institute, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, just to name a few, unanimously agree that sleep requirements for children aged 3 through 9 is significantly greater than the sleep requirements for children who are in their teenage years. On average, studies have shown that the recommended sleep requirement for a child aged 3 through 9 is between 11 and a half and 13 hours per night, or we'll go with 12, I think. Contrast that with the recommended sleep requirement for the average teenager, which is 7 and a half to 9 hours a night. 
it is, it is scientifically accepted that proper sleep in a, for a young child is critical to their mental, social, and physical development. And the deficiency of sleep at such a young age can lead to physical, mental, emotional, and psychological challenges that will follow these kids for the rest of their lives. But here's the thing. These scientific studies fail to take into account that life is not lived in a laboratory environment. Growing up, I was blessed with loving, engaged parents, but not a lot of money. Like many Maine families, my parents struggled to stay above the poverty line while raising two small children. At a, at a, as a very young child, my parents cared for my every need. I wanted nothing. They knew it was important that I had the benefit of sleep and proper nutrition and activities that would allow me to grow and develop. I played and did sports and did all the things a little kid should do. As I got older and into high school, I began to work. That meant I had to learn about responsibility, hard work, and what it took to be successful. Every step along the way of my grade school to high school life was designed to develop me to be prepared for the real world. Getting up early in the morning as a high school student was part of that. Because in the real world, you don't often get to set your own work schedule. Sometimes that schedule starts early. Your boss expects that you take the responsibility seriously enough that you get the sleep required to perform. If you don't take that responsibility seriously, you can't call your boss and say, sorry, I just need another hour of sleep. We need to start preparing our children for the real world. In the real world, they will struggle. They will occasionally fail, and sometimes that will be spectacularly. They will have to do jobs they don't like to do, and they will have to work hard for what they want to accomplish. They also will likely have to get up early to go to these jobs. Hopefully, through it all, they learn and grow and mature as people. High school kids getting up at 6.30 is not a detriment. It's a good start to them being prepared for life. We need to stop taking these lessons away from our kids because we seem to have forgotten that the real life awaits them all, sooner or later. The lessons that they learn now will provide them key skills along the way for the rest of their lives. So I'll continue to prepare my kids for the real world because someday I won't be there to protect them anymore. I won't be there to shield them and guide them in it. They'll have to do this for themselves, and I want them to be prepared for that eventuality. To sacrifice sleep for our youngest in order to increase sleep for the oldest is illogical and goes against all peer-reviewed studies about this. It also removes a very crucial period of learning for our teens that will prepare them to become successful adults. So I urge you to fully reconsider this time change. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Connolly, and I live at 4 Memory Lane. I'm going to read a letter that I wrote to the Board of Education and the superintendent prior to the recent correspondence that was sent uh, with the change in the grading for the current freshman and the incoming freshman. Uh, because a compromise has been made in the grading for my eighth grader, uh, it doesn't impact my family the same way that it did when I wrote the letter. But I wanted to speak and let every parent here know our experience with discussions about the grading portion and the transcripts of proficiency-based grading without a hybrid zero to one or zero to 100 grading. I think it matters to everyone here with a child under um, eighth grade, I guess at this point. Uh, my family and I have just returned from a week long college tour for our 16 year old daughter. It was a whirlwind of tours and interviews, a very exciting time in her life. We had the opportunity to sit down and talk with real admissions representatives, and because we also have a 13-year-old son heading into Scarborough High School next year, we asked them about the proficiency-based education grading system that has been adopted by the district. After leaving the meetings, my husband and I left with a very clear understanding as to how it was going to impact our son. We went to seven different colleges in the South, so it wasn't part of the 74 colleges that have apparently indicated that <coughs> they're looking at these transcripts in a different way. Um, colleges require a GPA for admittance. Um, it was a GPA at all seven of the schools that we went to. One counselor at a smaller university told us that she had to spend hours on one application because it came without a GPA and she had to contact all of the teachers that that student had to try and translate his transcript into a GPA so she knew where to place him. It was a significant waste of time to her that was obviously clearly frustrating. 
Um, she has a hard time determining if a student is actually passing a class by the system. Do they need remedial math if they didn't get a god at all the way through? What if they had a two at the beginning and then it went to a three? Did they need, did they not get that beginning part? She, it's confusing. And this was a smaller school. We also looked at some larger schools. Um, imagine if you were at UVA and you were getting 30,000 applications and a handful came from Maine. That didn't make any sense to them. Where does that application go? They're going to be put at a disadvantage. Um, honors colleges are determined by a GPA. If you have a certain GPA at every college that offers an honor college, you can apply. Under the system, if we don't have the 0 to 100 GPA, how do we apply for honors college? Merit-based scholarships are determined by a GPA coming into the school. Of course, the rigor of the classes play a part, but the GPA is a deciding factor. We were told by one school what the merit would be just based on our daughter being an honor society. They didn't even know what her actual GPA was. They knew it was a minimum of this, and this is, this is her potential. I, we, if, without that, it's a significant financial burden to our families. We left the tours excited for our daughter. We also left with a significant amount of anxiety for our son, who's not going to have the same opportunities with this grading system. We uh, were left with these choices. Send him to a private school. We moved to Maine from Florida for the public schools. My husband's a graduate from Scarborough High School. We're a big supporter of public schools, but if there's not a change in the grading, this is an option we're going to have to look at. It's going to be a financial burden to our family. We'll be paying for private college or private high school with money we would be spending on college. We have to consider possibly moving to a main district that has adopted the hybrid system of grading and we're going to, con and we're going to continue it. We don't want to pull our son out of the school where all of his friends are, but we are considering his future. We've also thought about moving out of Maine. We love it here, but we love our kids more. And if we were going to do it all over again, I can tell you that we would not have considered moving to Maine if this grading system was in place, not just in Scarborough, but the whole state. If we researched the schools before we moved here, and this would not have been a consideration for us 14 years ago. Option four is to stay right where we are, and that's our favorite option. And this is one that's in your hands. You, if you have kids ages 14 and under, I guess now it's 12 and under, um, you might be sitting in our same shoes wondering what to do. When your child is not getting into the college of their choice or not eligible for merit money or honors college, what, do you, what will you do? We want a hybrid grading system for our kids that allow for a GPA on transcripts. We insist it. You have the futures of our children in your hands and um, we want you to leave a legacy that's positive for them. And so that was the letter I wrote. And I want to just end it with this. Um, I regret that I didn't get involved in these discussions sooner. Um, I regret that my 13-year-old son came up to me at the beginning of the school year and asked us to consider putting him in Chevrolet for his high school um, career because he was unhappy with the grading system as a 13-year-old. Um, he was worried about how it was going to impact him, and he's 13. Um, I didn't get involved until after I heard it from college admissions counselors, and I feel bad that I didn't listen to him a little bit closer. If a 13-year-old saw the writing on the wall during the first quarter of his eighth grade year, and the superintendent, or how did not I, I guess was what I wanted to know. So I believe that you as the Board of Education, the superintendents, should have the, our kids' best interest at heart and their markability, marketability at heart. And I don't believe that this system of grading does. If uh, Scarborough does away with the hybrid 0 to 100 GPA, I believe it will be a negative impact on the future of the school, students of Scarborough High School. Krista Nilsson, 23 Morning Street. I support the compromise. I believe in the science, and I believe in academic and professional research. I am not questioning anyone on their credentials or experience or the amount of time that they've spent gathering data. I know it's been a lot. Um, I am respectfully asking you to consider this analogy. 
science, research, academics, they all agree that before a pilot flies a plane, the plane must be fully built. It must pass FAA regulations. Every fluid tank must be filled properly. The engines undergo strict testing. Every bolt must be in place before the public travels on this new aircraft. We do not fly the plane while we are simultaneously installing the seats and checking the engines. I bring this up because science tells us what helps or hurts us. It tells us what the best practices are. However, science does not exist in a vacuum. On February 15th, um, New Canaan, Connecticut, the town revealed that um, they will hold off on changing start times to a, to a drastic change because they wanted to make sure that they gathered all of the information and that they did testing and that they made sure that the impact on the community would be as small as possible. Um, in the interest of time, I will not read the press surrounding this, but I encourage you to do so as New Canaan is a near mirror image of Scarborough. We have low income families in this town. They cannot afford child care cost increases. We have kids who attend vocational school, and the original proposed time of starting the high school at 850 would have left them in the lurch. I appreciate the compromise now, truly. I do. I remember last year standing here at this podium advocating for the compromise. I, I'm, I'm unclear as to why it wasn't entertained last year. Um, last year in this room, uh, I believe the former school board chair referred to the child care, vocational school issues, transportation issues, after school jobs, costs, family time, sports, theater, extracurriculars, the list goes on. Um, unfortunately, these are referred to as inconveniences. This comment further stigmatizes families who may not be in the upper tier of income, families who struggle. So please compromise, please. Had this board compromised last year, I strongly believe that our community would not be as fractured as it is right now. There would be mutual trust fostered, there would be mutual respect fostered, and we would not be here in this moment talking about start times. You have the power to fix this. You have the power to be heroes for this community. You have the power to compromise. And you have the power to heal the wounds that we've all been dealing with for the last year. Please, do the right thing. I truly believe that you all know what that is. Thank you. We've got to move along. No, I wasn't going to take him. I said he's not speaking. So, folks, I need you to respect the rules of the chamber because we need to, we have guests here and we need to move along. So, Sarah will be the last speaker. Oh, Sarah. Isn't this Sarah? Oh, Sarah Blaisdell. Yes. Yeah. Everybody but me can speak. Well, she, you just oh, jumped in line. But I'm injured. I, <laughs> I can also cut it off here if we need to. I, we need to move along. We have guests here. Okay, so Sarah will be our last speaker. Janine Pendergast to Phineas Lane. Um, I am here to talk about the proficiency-based education. I have a daughter in sixth grade, um, and she and I have both really struggled this year with the grading system to really understand and feel confident of where she is um, grade-wise in school. She actually has said to me there's a lot of numbers that you can get between 1 and 100 in a grading system. There's not a lot between 1 and 4. 
and she feels that it's very difficult for her to differentiate herself from other people when everyone ideally is going to get a three. And so she said, if everyone is getting a three, how can you tell, how can I tell if I'm doing any better than the kid next to me if we have the same grade? Um, and I also believe that um, kids are seeing it as you get a three and that's good enough. And I don't think if kids um, got an 85 that they would think, oh, good enough. I don't need to strive to get 100. Whereas I think that, you know, it's seen as almost extra credit to try to get a four. Um, I almost feel like an analogy of the proficiency-based education is similar to when we were back in school and we were allowed to take classes pass-fail. You passed, did you get an 85, did you get 100, it doesn't really matter because you passed. And I feel like that's, that's what the proficiency-based education is doing for our kids. Um, I also um, expressed concern about this and asked about how would kids be placed um, to figure out as they get older if they need to be in remedial or um, advanced classes. And I was told that they um, will look a lot at the STAR and the MEA and the, the state tests. And I believe, I'm not positive, but I believe that those are scored more traditionally than they are proficiency-based. So if you're saying that you're going to use those more traditional <laughs> tests to grade, to place kids, I don't understand why you wouldn't just have the hybrid grading system. Um, and lastly, um, I was also told that um, with the hybrid grading system that some kids that didn't do homework um, had gotten penalized because that counted for a portion of their grade and that some kids that were smart but that didn't necessarily do all of their homework, that this proficiency-based grading would allow them to be in higher level, level classes if that's where, they're, um, where they should be. And I just don't understand why we would um, <coughs> give kids that don't do homework a better opportunity than hardworking kids. Um, that do all of their work and get their work done on time. Because if everybody, you know, if somebody is smart and gets a three but doesn't do homework, does that person really deserve the same thing as a kid that does all their work and gets a three? I don't think so. I don't think that's how life works. Thank you. Hi, um, Brandy Rubin, uh, 1 Frederick Thompson Drive. And um, I was here the other night, but I didn't have my notes and tried to wing it, but tonight I have my notes. <laughs> um, I just want to thank the board again and the superintendent for um, presenting the compromise plan. Um, I really think that it's the best for Scarborough, um, and I'm just going to speak for Scarborough. Um, as a healthcare care prof uh, provider, and I'm also going to speak on behalf of my husband, who is a board-certified physician, internal medicine, Dr. Cliff Rubin. Um, we are both on the same page as far as the compromise plan. We um, are big research people. Um, we do, we read articles and articles. We understand the science behind the need to start for adolescents to start after 8.30. We get it. We fully support it. However, in our town, uh, given budget restrictions, bus issues, geography, um, just don't think that 8.30 start time for the adolescents is possible because the way it's been presented has swapped sleep issues for adolescents for the younger children and I think that we really should be considering the sleep needs for the younger children as well. Uh, the younger children require more hours of sleep even though adolescent sleep cycles shift. Um, it's the younger kids who require more hours and in your typical uh, two-person income home where they work um, on average most of them get out of work at 5 p.m. are getting home, their kids picked up from aftercare at 5:30, which they're in aftercare now because the older students won't be available to take help take care of these children because they'll be getting out later 
Um, these families are often getting home at six o'clock at night, and by the time you're um, getting settled, eating dinner, doing all those things, it's really difficult to get them into bed for 12 hours of sleep. Um, the compromise plan, we feel like it really does um, support um, all age groups. Um, eight o'clock for high school, middle school is not 8.30. However, it's closer to 8.30 than the current 7.35, 7.45 time frames. Um, the other thing, uh, so again, thinking about the research for adolescents um, starting school after 8.30, we also should be thinking about the research that says children require, the younger children require more hours. <coughs> and there's also plenty of research out there that states that younger children who are routinely not able to obtain their hours of sleep, um, have decreased ability to pay attention in class, um, oftentimes can lack motivation, um, sometimes academic achievement can suffer. And again, I'm not saying that all children, but um, so, you know, there's science that can support pretty much any argument that you can come up with. Um, so again, in a perfect world, all of our schools, I think, should start after 8.30. Um, but again, given budgetary constraints, buses, things like that, I just don't think it's possible. So I think the compromise plan um, <coughs> closer, closer matches the sleep needs of all age groups. Um, and again, um, I think it was mentioned, yeah, it was mentioned earlier, I wrote a note no, down here, that um, uh, by, um, having high school kids start um, after 8.30, they would get an, I believe it was an average one extra hour of sleep. Um, currently, my daughter in middle school gets home at about 2.30. Um, she has a lot of activities um, at night. So from 2.30 to 3.30, she's got a good hour where she sits home and does her homework. Where she gets home at nine o'clock at night, it would be unrealistic to ask her to just start her homework at nine o'clock at night. So there goes your extra hour of sleep. Um, so again, um, I appreciate the um, attempt to work at compromise. Um, I think others, it's also a good idea because other school districts in our area that we share resources with, um, vocational schools, um, extracurricular activities, um, and that includes athletics, but also um, other activities like, oh, I don't know, jazz band, um, math club, <coughs> things like that. Um, so, you know, by being um, more in line with those other school districts that have already made those changes. Sorry. Can you wrap it up a little yes, bit? Yes, I will. Um, by being more in line with those um, schools, it'll make it less likely that schools, uh, students have to um, <coughs> miss school instruction time in order to make those other activities, which are also important. Um, and, um, allows students to have uh, jobs after school and helps children get those required hours of sleep. And I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you come over here? <laughs> My name is Sophie Kelly and I, and I live at 3 Sandy Point Road. I spoke at a board meeting last year. I am not a doctor or a teacher or a parent or a taxpayer, but I am currently a second grader at Pleasant Hill School, and I think my opinion is important too, because start times actually affect me. I still go to bed at 7 p.m., and I still get up at 7 a.m. My little sister is six and, is, and in kindergarten, and she sleeps even longer than I do, until 8.30 a.m. I sleep 12 hours a night, and she sleeps over than 13 hours a night. We are still little and growing and need our sleep, too. We can't be at a bus stop at 7 a.m. next year. We're just as important to consider as the older kids. My sister and I do a lot of after-school activities that we love, and if we have to go to bed one to one and a half hours earlier next year, we will not be able to do all our, our favorite things anymore, and that doesn't seem fair to us. If you go ahead with what you adopted last year and change your K-5 school start times to 8 a.m. I know my sister and friends and I will get less sleep and it's really not a good thing when little kids don't get enough sleep. <laughs> I 
love school, but it will be worse next year because we won't all actually be able to go to bed <coughs> at, at 6 p.m., so we'll be very tired. <coughs> Please don't change my K-5 start time to 8 a.m. Please compromise and consider what's best for all Scarborough students. Sure. Compromise is a wor big word, but I know exactly what it means because I looked it up in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Way to find a happy medium to strike a balance, give and take. I may only be eight, but I think compromise is the right thing for you to do here. Thank you for listening. Hi, uh, Matt Sither, 14 Huntley Drive. Um, I've heard this list of uh, 73, now 74 colleges uh, in New England that are treating proficiency-based transcripts equally to merit-based transcripts. And um, I just want to caution the board about uh, buying into this too deeply. Um, I took a closer look at the list, and it's kind of alarming how many schools are not on the list. Um, I did some digging and looked at Scarborough Senior's uh, college applications from last year. And of all of the applications sent to New England colleges, 41% uh, of them were not on that list. Um, that means if we had full-blown PB, then 41% of those applications would have been disadvantaged. Um, so I appreciate the lead teachers um, and Principal Creech for putting together the hybrid system. Um, to make this data point feel a little more concrete, uh, I wanted to give you a little subset of the colleges um, seniors apply to that are not on the list. Um, Boston College, Bentley, Brandeis, Brown, Endicott, Mass Maritime, Maine Maritime, Merrimack, Middlebury, Northeastern, which we sent a lot of kids to, have since I graduated, uh, Providence, Springfield, St. Joe's, St. Mike's, Stonehill, UNE, Wesleyan, Wheaton, and WPI. So I urged the board and the superintendent, whatever you do with PBE, do not abandon the hybrid system anytime soon. Full-blown PB should not be on the table. Right. Hi there. Amy Glidden, 104 Ash Swamp Road. I just want to make a brief comment about the late start and then move on to PBE. I'm really happy you guys have made, um, I'm thinking about anyway, making a compromise to that late start plan. I, um, I, I, I believe the science. I do, 100%. I actually work in a late start school. We were forced to go to late start so our students could attend the Biddeford Center of Technology and we said if they told us if we didn't get on board then we would have to find another Vogue school. So I really understand um, the dilemma of late start and I really do 100% believe in the science. But I also believe in common sense and I believe that if you're going to do a late start, you better be able to support it. And you can't support it here. You don't have the busing to do so. You don't have the bus drivers to do so. You might not even pay the bus drivers enough so you can recruit bus drivers. So do late start. Listen to those really smart doctors that seem to be coming up here over and over and over again to tell you about the science. But do it when you can afford it so you don't sacrifice the entire district. I just have a question. You don't have to answer me, but I keep on hearing about this bus audit. And um, no one seems to be able to get their hands on that bus audit. But I did hear an acquaintance of mine got it recently and looked at it. And I wonder if the board has seen that bus audit and has read that bus audit. Because if they have, I can't even imagine why they, for months, looked at an 8.50 start time. Because the bus audit does not tell you that you can do that. So we can all look at data all day long, but we have to look at all the data, not the data that you want us to look at. So on to PBE. Um, I, uh, I, my kids are going to be done this year. My, my youngest graduates in June, and I've loved this district. This district has served them well. I'm very fortunate that they can both be called Scarborough High School graduates. And I look in the room and I see so many incredible teachers who have educated my kids. But if my kids didn't have the hybrid system, or even if you took their, if you stripped their transcript away, 
he would have disadvantaged them. Matt talked about the list of schools who um, aren't on that list, the 41%. Maine Maritime and Stonehill College, both schools where my students, my, my children will be. My son's a sophomore there. My daughter is fortunate to be going there in the fall. And she's fortunate enough to go there on an athletic scholarship and a merit-based scholarship. She's, it's a Division II school. And Division II, they like to spread their scholarship money out for their athletes. They're called equivalency scholarships. You can go on the NCAA Clearinghouse and read about that. They like to get as many athletes as they can. So they like to take the number of scholarships that they can give to their athletes and spread them out. So they like to give a combination of athletic money and merit money. And they need that transcript. When my daughter was being recruited, it started as early as her freshman year in high school. And they wanted to see her transcript, not her one through four grading scale. She was required to sign up for the NCAA Clearinghouse. She had to submit her transcript with a decile rank and a GPA. They wanted to see that. Before they offered her scholarships, they wanted her transcript. Because why would they go down that road with her if she wasn't an academically competitive student for their school? She needed to show that. It's very, very difficult to get an athletic scholarship. 3% perhaps get that opportunity. And if she didn't have that, then they would have looked at the next very good basketball player because she couldn't prove that maybe she was ready and able to be a competitive student athlete at that school. So when you guys take away the transcript and the decile rank and the GPA, you are disadvantaging every student athlete that comes down the pike who has the dream since they were in the third grade to play college sports. And that would be really irresponsible for you guys to do so. There's no need to do it. Scapula isn't broken. We are one of the best districts in the state. This mandate is probably going to go away. They've had since 2012 to get it right. There's still talk about it being repealed or at least changed. And they give local control. You guys can give a test to show proficiency. You don't have to do what you're doing. It's not broken. You don't need to fix it. We're a good school, and I hope that every student that comes after my kids has an opportunity like my kids had. Because you guys need to stop thinking about Scarborough as a Petri dish. It doesn't need to be fixed. It's great already. Thank you. Sarah Blaisdell, 5 Farmhouse Road. I wrote you all last night about start times. Tonight, I'm here to talk to you about PBE. Our schools are amazing. Our staff is amazing. We go above and beyond. Our students are amazing. <coughs> I want all these things to remain amazing for my children. The state has put a hold on PBE. Schools around us that have gone to a one, for, one through four scale only are struggling. I have heard from teachers in South Portland that their students are getting responses back from colleges that they don't understand their transcripts. I have heard from teachers in Westbrook that their projected graduation percentage has gone down. I appreciate that the high school has been given the opportunity to use the system that they have created for next year's incoming freshman class. Now is the time to pause and listen and learn from those around us. We need to have all stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, administrators, board of, board of education members, and anyone else that cares involved when making decisions about how we move forward with proficiency-based grading. My name is 
Mr. Lisha gift a sale of it to Saratoga Lane. Um, regarding the uh, school start times, my objection has always been uh, to the process and the way that um, that decision has been arrived. Um, I don't necessarily, for our family, we'll make it happen one way or the other. Um, so I thank you for the compromise that's on the table. I'm hopeful that that will begin to rebuild the goodwill. Um, Regarding the proficiency-based learning, I do have uh, significant concerns about it and how it Im is impacting my daughter, who's in the eighth grade. Um, she was a uh, high honor student when that was available, both sixth and seventh grade. She's um, significantly decreased the amount of homework that she puts in at night. She's both intrinsically and e extrinsically motivated, and I think that the um, the elimination of the honor roll has taken away that uh, extrinsic motivation for her. I come home now, I find her when she's not involved in uh, sports on the couch watching Netflix when last year I found her studying pretty diligently. Um, she, I told her that she could make up her grades to a, a four and that that opportunity was always available to her. She's <coughs> gone to see her teachers after she's gotten a three or a 3.5 and at times has been given the message that maybe that that's not a realistic expectation or that that's not a goal that she needs to um, work towards. Maybe it's, I guess the message being that she's um, too much of a high achiever, which she, she can be and that can be stressful, but um, it doesn't seem to sort of match the message. And I think that that's because the teachers are having a hard time dealing with it. I also think that it's really difficult to to manage that in, in a classroom where the kids have a lot of different needs. Uh, finally, I would like to just speak about the proficiency, my concerns about proficiency education in general. Uh, I'm sure that the board's aware of that. I don't know how much the general public is, and I'm certainly no expert on it, but um, I think you need to follow the money where, where this has come from. Um, <coughs> who's paid for the studies that we're relying on in making these decisions, and um, whether those are studies that we want to believe without having any other information. Obviously, you know, I think most of us knows that Bill Gates funded, his foundation has funded um, these studies, and I know one of the um, underlying agencies, the, the New England Consortium was cited tonight as, as, um, as a source of information and certainly they've obtained money. It's filtered into our state and into schools that have already implemented proficiency-based um, programs. And so when you cite the studies, when you cite the experts, I think it's really important to go back to who funded the studies, who's funded the research and what their motivations are in, in doing that. That will close public comment. Um, we'll move right on to our workshop, um, and I'll have the superintendent introduce our guests. Thank you for being patient. Yes, um, I think that was helpful for our guests to hear the public comment, so I do echo Jody's um, thanks and you being here for that portion. Um, tonight, to answer the many proficiency-based education questions that we all have in the community, we have invited um, some local experts to come and guide us um, we have Paul Ham um, Hamilton from the Department of Education. He is the Chief Academic Officer who's here tonight to talk with us about where the DOE is and their decision making and also where they're headed in terms of um, proficiency-based education regulations in the state and proficiency-based diploma laws. We also have Senator Langley joining us tonight, so thank you for being here. And Mark Costin's from the, Mark Costin is the Associate Director at Great Schools Partnership who will be here to give a presentation presentation and talk with us about um, many of the questions that you have. I have shared these questions with our guests um, so they know what you've been emailing us and they know some of the, the thoughts and wonders that you have. Just one point of clarification, um, there is no plan to eliminate transcripts in Scarborough um, or decile ranking or GPA. So that just to kind of put it right out there. Um, I heard that come up in the comment section. So with that, I would ask that Paul start us off with a message from the Department of Education. And the idea tonight really is for this to be a workshop. So you see us sitting here with administrators in the district um, along with our school board and our guests and students so that we can really have a dialogue and make sure
for that. We're asking those questions um, for board members and administrators. If you've heard a question from a parent or a student um, and you want to bring that back up tonight so that we can all hear it as a community together, I think that would be helpful. Um, and feel free to ask questions as we go along. The goal is for all of us to be here with some clarity um, in our understanding around proficiency-based education in Maine generally as a state, but also here in Scarborough. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm, uh, I've been at the department now for about a year, uh, going, it'll be a year uh, in June, and this has been high on my uh, work list of things to work on. Uh, um, my background is as a teacher. Uh, I was an English teacher and a special ed teacher, and I, I come at this, uh, this situation, this problem with a lot of experience in classrooms as well as in education policy through some other roles I've, I've served in. Um, so it, at the department, we, um, we did release a set of rules in August of, this, of last year. Uh, there were rules 134 is the number that's assigned to them. And in the normal process of that rulemaking, uh, we take comments uh, when we release rules. Uh, and those comments reflected, I would say, a lot of the things that some of uh, people here have said, uh, uh, concerns about what's happening in terms of uh, uh, districts uh, um, having struggling with um, what does proficiency mean? Um, grading systems, how, how do we handle those things? How do we handle transcripts? Uh, there were a lot of comments that came in about that. In fact, it came into the point that we decided to pause uh, the process. There's a formal process in rulemaking. Uh, and at that point, we decided to pause it. Uh, and we went out and engaged with deeper conversations with uh, all kinds of people. We talked with teachers across the state, with school board members, with administrators, with principals, uh, with uh, just about anybody that would, would sit down and talk with us. And what we really discovered through that process was that um, it, that there was the level of concern that we heard as well as the level of success. So I will say that, you know, you heard some success, people here talking about uh, successes. We heard those too. Uh, but we really realized that we needed to uh, get some clarity so uh, about about what the legislator, legislature wanted us to do. At the department, <coughs> we really, um, our role as an agency is to carry out what we, what the legislature and the governor passed through legislative action. Uh, we promulgate rules, things like that, that, that have to fit within the boundaries of, of the statutory language. So uh, on a bill about a month ago now, I guess, we, uh, it was a bill to delay proficiency education. The department testified neither for nor against, and uh, I spoke uh, to the uh, education committee myself and, and said that the struggle we were having was that uh, particularly one area of law we narrowed it down to and I can remember the it, it's in I don't remember the site exactly but it's the it describes the diploma as something a diploma will be awarded when a student reaches proficiency in all eight areas uh, and my challenge with that and after talking with my colleagues at the department was that's what we were struggling with that we really we really were if we take that at the straight face value of what what that says we were we were concerned that we were setting up a situation that was going to result in uh, a lot of kids not being able to meet that bar uh, that there would be that was one of our concerns and and from that trickled out a lot of other things what uh, after we presented that that idea the uh, the education committee challenged us to come back and talk to them about what we thought what changes would perhaps need to be made made in order for us to promulgate rules uh, to to get this moving and uh, um, make it happen so uh, we did come back with some amendments and we've been working uh, with the with uh, the legislators uh, over the last few months um, and at first we came back with one uh, an amendment idea that was I will say it kind of mirrors what happened when we moved from No Child Left Behind to ESSA. When in that situation, 
Uh, I won't go into it a lot unless you want me to, but we moved from something that was setting a high bar, saying all kids will, will close all the gaps and all kids will get to a certain place by 2014. So there was a, there was a very high stakes kind of agenda under that. The, the goal was laudable. It was, an, uh, it was a goal of trying to bring kids as far as we can get them to close achievement gaps where we see them. Uh, and to, but, but where it fell down was on that, the idea that we were going to get all kids to the same place at a certain time. So the proposal we made was, uh, the, the first proposal we made was that we would eliminate the high stakes diploma. And what we would do instead is really look at, at how do we help kids from pre-K all the way up, starting back in that direction, and thinking how do we move uh, uh, so that we're helping all kids get as far as they can. And then we track that data just like we do in uh, ESSA, our, our accountability system. Uh, and that, the concern that arose then was, what does a diploma mean? So now you get to the question of what does a diploma mean in Maine when we, when we actually say we're going to award a student a diploma? Does that mean they graduated with low skills? Does that mean they graduated with mediocre skills, with high skills? Uh, and so that's, that's the next challenge. The other moving piece of this is what do we expect kids to be able to do by the time they graduate high school? And do we want to create a statewide definition for that? that's different than all students will be proficient in all eight areas of the learning results when they exit high school. So that's been our challenge, is trying to say where is that mark and, and where do we land on that. that that's that been the work we've been doing, uh, is to try to find a, a kind of a middle position about what are we expecting all kids in the state to be able to do it regardless of their zip code, regardless of, so that we can help all kids reach a, reach a level where that diploma is going to mean something. And at the same time, take care of kids that, uh, that struggle to get there, whether they have special education needs, or they learn slower, or they're late bloomers, uh, or, or whatever pathway they find, uh, that, that how do we help all kids get there without creating a bar that's going to trip people up at the same time. That's essentially where we're at right now, is trying to find uh, a sweet spot. During, during the course of this, and I'll just say one other that happened in the legislature, uh, during the course of this, there was a, uh, one of the committee members on the, legis on the uh, Ed Committee made a motion to scrap the system. Uh, that motion uh, was tabled by the committee, uh, and so that's, that's, that happened in the midst of this of this discussion. So it kind of changes the stakes a little bit, and, and we're, this is where we stand now. Uh, we, over the next week or so, uh, a couple weeks, we think that you know, we'll still we'll be there talking about how do we find a pathway. Uh, I guess the final comment I'll make on, on how uh, my experience since being in Maine, uh, since 2012, and kind of watching the evolution of this along with other things is, that anytime you, you tackle a project like this, which proficiency-based diplomas with uh, diploma and PBE is, a, is an enormous undertaking in our state. Uh, it, it, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have you're going to have to make adjustments along the way. So the law was passed in 2012. There was an adjustment that happened in 2015. There have also been some times where uh, the legislature has, has uh, passed uh, amendments that delayed the implementation. So I think everybody has understood that this is not a journey that happens quickly. It is an implementation process that takes time. And uh, what, what we're proposing right now at the department is an iteration of that that clarifies some things uh, that we'd be able to go out under uh, under this idea and talk to stakeholders around the state again through a different kind of rulemaking process called consensus rules and we come up with some a real solid definition of what is what is it we want kids to be ready to do to be competent at to be proficient at by the time they they uh, uh, graduate from high school so that they're ready for the next steps in their life whatever those might be and I, and I will say, well, one last word, and I want to say that, that the young lady that came up 
and uh, spoke here today. If you're looking for an example of someone who demonstrates proficiency, <laughs> that, that would probably be a four in my book. If I, or maybe it's a 100 or maybe it's an A plus. I'm not sure which grade. But, you know, when we talk about proficiency, it's a mind shift in a sense from doing the work, completing the assignment, to showing through some kind of demonstration that you really know this stuff. What you saw there was an example of an incredible uh, demonstration of proficiency for, for a child in reading. Uh, I think the other thing we'll see in proficiency de uh, definitions would be something like a psychometric definition of proficiency. And that's the one we use in our MEAs, our state testing. That's actually an approximation to some degree, or a guess. It's a test. So, but it's, 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 it's making a psychometric guess that's pretty, pretty close as to what a child's uh, proficiency is in ELA or in math or in science or some other skill. Uh, another defini definition of proficiency that you see in our state is in our amazing career and technical education schools. Uh, the example I like to use is, do you want somebody that can fix your brakes 98%? <laughs> you don't. Uh, and you'll see that throughout our CTE schools, that we want the uh, proficiency there is demonstrated through a performance that the kids work very hard. When we, when we bring our car in to get it surfaced in the, uh, in the uh, auto, auto shop, we expect it to come back fixed. And, and that's an example of proficiency as well. So we really do have to try, uh, and that's what we're trying to do at the department uh, through this, through uh, some uh, proposed amendment, is to say, let's get to it, let's figure out what we mean by proficiency so that we can, so that we can move on and, and talk about uh, how we do the best for kids. Because to me, there's no doubt in anybody I've ever talked to that we really are all about trying to provide opportunities for our students in our state to do the very best they can. That's my statement. I'll take questions <laughs> unless you want to go on to. I, I wanted to clarify, um, so as it stands now, you require districts to give out proficiency-based diplomas, but the, but the level of proficiency is determined on a, at a local level? That's what's happened. And, and uh, what you're trying to get to is a state level of proficiency that everyone adheres to? Um, at some level, that's correct. Because, because the, the challenge you have with that is that um, what does a diploma mean? If I get a diploma uh, and, it, and it's at different levels of proficiency in different places. Uh, and in some sense, that's, that's the challenge you have with an A to, a to F grading system too. Is uh, unless you have a definition of what, what does that mean? Well, if I give a student in my class, I was an English teacher, so if I, if I give a student in my class an A or a B or a C, what does it mean? Does it mean they completed a bunch of assignments, or does it mean that you know, they reached a certain level of, uh, of uh, skills in, in that? In that. And, and the other challenge you may have with a credit-based system that uses a, 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 a grade point average or those kind of grades is I may take a, a, an English class that's less challenging, someone may, and another student take an English class that's a lot more challenging. So maybe I'm taking AP English, and over here I'm taking, uh, I used to teach vocational English for kids that uh, were really struggling in English. Well, an A in one class is different than an A in another class. So really what, what, what uh, proficiency education is trying to get to is what can you really do? What can you demonstrate as, as the skill? What have you really reached? That's, that's the mind shift that's there. And I understand that the, the grading systems are a challenge. That we, we Honestly, I think across the state, we haven't really figured that out yet. That some places feel pretty good about it, but other places are really struggling. Parents are struggling with this. But the grading is also a local choice, is that, is that correct? Right. That's very much a local choice. Uh, that's not part of what uh, is a, a mandate. Uh, so those are the things that I think we have to keep working on. My question is a little connected to Hillary's. Um, you said that, and I appreciate you being here as the messenger of this information, um, that you're looking to work toward a statewide definition of what do we expect kids to be able to do regardless of zip code. Um, and I think that that's a really noble goal and great thing to work toward. My question is, will that um, 
mandate or work come with state or federal funding or will that fall to the local um, municipalities to take care of the funding for that work? Well, uh, there, I, I, I don't see, that. that's actually something I don't get to decide myself, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that is something we can sure talk about how do we do that, because it represents different challenges in different parts of the state. I, I will say that across our state, one of the things uh, is the equity of access to our kids across our state is pretty dramatically different, uh, depending on where you are. We have fabulous schools everywhere in the state. Uh, but there are places where those opportunities are a lot richer, uh, a, a lot more varied, and, and other places in the state where it's more restricted. And, and one of, that's one of the issues we have broadly in our state, is how do we address that. Some of that happens through our funding formula, uh, and I realize that that has its own controversy too, the high receiver, low receiver, and depends on where you stand in the state. But those are the challenges we face when we look at any any broad initiative <coughs> one, of, one of my goals in thinking about this if we move forward with this is we have another whole part of uh, the department that I work with which is our federal team our ESSA team and that's one that's where you look at uh, accountability systems for schools uh, we use the MEAs for that which are coming up I hope everybody gets a good night's sleep uh, and uh, other other uh, metrics uh, that we we look at schools and say how are schools doing compared to each other and we're, we're pivoting and Commissioner Hassan has been really insistent on this we're moving away from the idea that we're we're grading schools, punishing schools, ranking schools. And we're moving toward, we want to move toward a system where what we're doing is looking where we have difficult situations, where schools have, uh, maybe there are, there are a lot of schools with very high poverty in their schools. Uh, we may have schools with uh, high absentee rates, for, which can be connected to all kinds of reasons. Uh, low, low achievement uh, is often reflected in, in the same mix. So what do we do to help those schools? How do we direct resources? We get, you know, uh, seventy million dollars from the federal government that we use uh, Title One funding, Title funds. That's part of what we do with that money. Is how do we direct resources and help uh, coaching, uh, uh, professional development for those schools that that are struggling. Uh, so it is a balancing act. Funding is always a balancing act. And Excuse me, please. I think one of our problems is, and, and I was a teacher for 20 years, and I know that Senator Langley is a former teacher, we, we try and have systems and to have one size fit all. And that doesn't work. And that is a major problem, I think, that we're having with the proficiency based, because we have youngsters, as you said, in the CTEs who are very proficient. But we try and compare them with the youngsters that we have who are college bound and who are taking uh, uh, advanced courses. And we're trying to lump them into the same diploma system. It's not fair to them, and it's certainly not fair uh, to the school systems. And I recall when I was a teacher and, and on a committee for selection for National Honor Society, a student's name was brought up and she was at that point called a commercial student. But she was taking honors English and she was taking advanced math and she was doing a couple of others. She wasn't taking a foreign language. And somebody from the English department said, well, she shouldn't, she shouldn't take foreign language. And the person who taught Latin at our school said, oh, wait a minute. Can you do shorthand like she can? To us, that's a foreign language. And she's proficient in that. So we have to think outside of the box. And we're trying to put everybody in the same box. I, I, go ahead, Al. I appreciate your comment about supporting all students to get as far as they can. And so my question is, where is the department right now in regards to the role of an IEP 
in identifying uh, rigorous standards for students that may be off grade level, that may be below grade level, but those students are working very hard, they're making progress, they're achieving, uh, but it not may not be at grade level. And I don't want to see them disadvantaged. Right. But, Alice, would you uh, we should identify ourselves for these folks. Allison Marchese, Director of Special Services here. Thank you, <laughs> Did you figure Pretty that good. out? <laughs> I mean, the board has, has signs out here, so. So uh, I think there, there, was, uh, it, there was language in the, uh, there is language in the stat existing statute that, that uh, allows uh, schools to uh, take uh, special consideration of special needs kids. It has been it has been controversial in uh, in and of itself, uh, and you know we're we're still trying to figure that one out. I, we in the uh, current idea that we're looking at is 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 to essentially put that that kind of question back into the hands of an IEP and say that we really we really do want those kids to get as far as they can, but that there is already a formal process that. We use under federal law to to work through that uh, and 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 help those kids get as far as we can, so that there would be in, in a sense. And I'm going to use the word exception, even though it's maybe because it is exceptional education as well. But but I also think that that applies to some degree to any kid, to all kids. That all kids are different. They they don't. So when we that was my challenge and our challenge in reading the language in the statute that says all kids have to meet all eight areas of proficiency is that that yes I hope that's true and I hope we could get kids there if you just look at the straight face meaning of that uh, to graduate high school but but we need to be more open and honest about what we're trying to do because not all kids are going to get there and that. And that doesn't mean I'm giving up on them. So that's been the big challenge, you know, in saying such a thing. But I, I believe it's an honest thing to say, as a special ed teacher myself, that my job was to help that child go as far as they can and maybe exceed what they ever thought they could do. Uh, but if I'm a, if I if they're living with this the bar that they can never get over, uh, I know a lot of the kids that I used to work with. The failure was they, they knew how to do that. What they struggled with is succeeding. So I don't want to put something in front of them that automatically looks like I'm going to fail. Well, I appreciate your comments and, and your acknowledgement as well. And that is the position we have taken in Scarborough and moving forward um, and uh, with the uh, hoping that that's where we will land because there is um, contradictory language yeah. right now. Uh, so I'd like to see your support. I so wanted to clarify Senator Langley, do you think that is, it will be put on hold? What will be put on the Moving forward with proficiency based? Uh, we still have to take a vote. Um, my name is Brian Langley. I represent uh, Senate District 7, which is up in Hancock County. I represent 27 towns, just so that your, your audience will, will know who I am. Uh, uh, I spent uh, 27 years uh, teaching in, uh, at Hancock County Technical Center in uh, Ellsworth. I, uh, I taught culinary arts. Uh, I'm a certified executive chef. I own a restaurant in my private life as well. I'm retired from teaching now. So uh, I've been on the education committee for eight years, all four of my terms. I've chaired it three of those four terms. And so I was there when uh, proficiency-based um, this legislation, LD 1422, came in uh, into the legislature. So I've been there since the very beginning. Um, so um, we are um, at a point where, to answer your question, um, where we have uh, the, the charge that I had given to the department at our last um, work session was to come back with uh, a, a skinny enough amendment that would allow them to continue to write the rules. First of all, uh, you know, we publicly, the committee thanked the department for their work in that when they got all the comments back from the interested parties and the stakeholders that they said, we've got to go back and, and to the drawing board and get these rules right. So while some people, that may be a criticism, and sometimes you can kind of hear that, well, look, they couldn't get it, you know, we're still... I think that's uh, a commendation like it wasn't going um, and they had run it wasn't going as well as they would have liked so they're putting back and going back to the drawing board on this so 
much better than if they just promulgated the rules and not have them work well. So um, this has been a, a, an interesting uh, in a process. And it, if it was easy work, we'd already be done. So it's, <laughs> it, and, and frankly, um, it will never be done. Um, every, every two years, a third of the legislature turns over, and everybody who went to school feels they're an expert in education. <laughs> and there will be um, no shortage of bills to keep changing things. But we did have a bill last year to repeal completely. We had a, a bill on its own right, uh, proficiency-based law. And the numbers of, of teachers and students and that came in overwhelming support with evidence of, of uh, success uh, was really encouraging that it is hard work. And that while we're kind of struggling along, um, but there um, uh, there was there was broad support that the that the benefits for students were were there. Um, the way I like to describe it, because I spent nearly 30 years in a technical center, is uh, much like what Paul had said. Mine's a little different. If you if you um, if you get four out of five questions correct on a test, that's 80 percent, and in a numerical system, that's passing. But if you have four or five four out of five lug nuts put back on the front end of your car when you get your snow tires put on, um, that's 80 percent correct. But you can go 50 miles down the road, maybe 100 miles down the road, but you're eventually your tire falls off of the front end of your vehicle. And for me as a teacher, I taught culinary arts, juniors and seniors in high school, I would see that wheel fall off when those students would enter my class and couldn't add and subtract, multiply, divide fractions, couldn't do decimals, percents, or ratios. And this is where they needed to be able to apply those skills, that fifth lug nut, so to speak. And that's when the tire would fall off. So. The work that we've been doing was really to make sure that as students were progressing, that we knew that you know they had all five um, lug nuts on the front of their of their tire to help them go through. It hasn't been without its detractors. It's been difficult. I would say that um, um, for those whom the, the 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 system that had always worked for continues to say that it you know that it that it still works, but. I spent my career um, working with what I would call the castaway kids, kids that had been given up on, um, and um, they would end up in, in, in my program. Um, and um, when they could rate their work against a standard, not against whether they were better than someone else or not, when they could rate their work, whether it was saleable, you know, when you see there's a grading for system for a perfect, uh, 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 sort of a one through four for a perfect blueberry pie, um, and taste being one of those. Um, they would be comparing their work against a, sta a standard, not against uh, someone else. So that, you know, um, and I would also say that um, most school systems already have perf performance-based pieces already in their schools, K through two. You know, the report card is you know, can tell time to the quarter hour, can count to 10, knows their colors, knows the alphabet. So as things go on and everybody knows, the student knows, well, I can count to eight. You gotta work and get up to nine and 10. So um, my, my co-chair and I, who have uh, served together now six years, have uh, worked very hard to steady the ship and not take wild lurches back and forth. Because one of the bills that came through was scrap all the learning results, scrap everything, and adopt Massachusetts pre-2006 standards. And anybody who's a teacher in here go, don't ever ask me to do another thing in your life if you're just going to throw out the last eight years' worth of work. So we know it's hard, and we know it's uh, tough, tough sledding. But what I feel is more important is not to go lurching from um, you know, initiative to initiative um, and, and work our way through these bugs. We'll have a vote that'll be coming up. Um, there is a motion on the floor that's been tabled to totally repeal. Um, that motion will, uh, will not pass. I, I've talked to my committee members, um, mostly out of process because it didn't get a proper public hearing. We had a bill that was going to repeal those, and we're very much about doing things fairly. So uh, a motion <coughs> in the middle of another bill um, is not the right way to go. The department is going to be submitting uh, the, uh, an amendment of which uh, I've seen a, a look at it uh, uh, a couple of times, and they're working on that. Um, and uh, it'll have to sort of meet the same kind of requirement that it's not too much that would require a public hearing, and that we'd invite everybody in, but it's just enough to allow them to work. 
and if that doesn't meet that requirement then i then there would be support for uh, a, a one-year delay um in order to come back to the drawing board and uh, and try to do that um mr hamilton paul and diana uh have, um from my perspective as the chair of the committee have done yeoman's work to try to capture what a lot of people have been saying and to uh, turn it into into language from which the rules can be made is not an easy task if you ever sit down and do that i'm sure enough of you have tried to write policies here for the local school board uh, and lastly the last thing i'd like to say until you have questions is um, we had a bill in front of our committee last year and for um, late start uh, mandating across the state, state for schools and we said that's a local decision and so um, I'll be able to report back when I go back to the committee to that that bill sponsor uh, out of Brunswick um, that um, that it's not without its, uh, its uh, trials and tribulations at the at the local level. So, um, and then and then very lastly, it uh, it's really nice to see so many people out uh, at a school board meeting. I know that uh, it's uh, you know from my perspective, um, I, it's 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 hard and uh, and and people are very concerned about what's best for their kids and that's really heartwarming um, a lot of school systems have uh, districts have trouble finding enough people to serve on the school boards so um you know you'll develop a thick skin and uh and work through the issues and um, you'll come out the better for it so i'd be very glad to answer any questions i've, I've been on this uh, journey since the very beginning so I'm, I'm pretty well versed um both as a practitioner i i taught almost 30 years under performance-based system i'm very comfortable with it and very much supportive of it so uh, whatever i could do to to help i was not invited to this tonight when i heard paul was he told me he was coming down and i didn't know um that mark would be either i, I said well, let me go with you because walking in um by your own into the lion's den um, <laughs> it's really hard to do and uh and and we do care my committee cares very deeply about students and success of students in the state of maine so um whatever whatever we can do to help and uh, to help you on your journey I'd be glad to do it so i would just add it when I arrived to Maine here in Scarborough in 2016, um, proficiency-based education was well underway. And there was lots of questions then about whether this was going to stick or not, whether it was going to stay or go away. And so from day one, the mindset here in Scarborough has been the because the state said so is not our why. We're committed to this work because we know it's what's best for our students. However, the law does create a timeline for us that would not be our timeline. Um, it's forced us to have to dive into the grading system before we've had a chance to really shift that mindset and do that deep engagement with our community um, and really dig into our curriculum work and making sure that our standards and our curriculum are all aligned. So I appreciate people wanting to take a pause um, for us, I believe that our work will continue, our teachers will continue to be engaged and um, we'll, we'll keep moving forward because we know that at the end of the day it does create more opportunities and proficiency at the heart is designed to help us meet every student where they are and ask those two questions every day. What are they doing well and what are they ready to learn in every course and, and um, every class that they take. And so I know that we are having success with that in our classrooms because our teachers are doing just that. Um, the grading system does make it complex and emotional really quickly, especially when it's hard for us as educators to find electronic tools that allow us to actually track and monitor student progress in a really accurate way that is meaningful to parents and students. So I, um, I do know that that's something that we've also been struggling with here and trying to fit sort of like a square peg in a round hole with the electronic grading system. I, I would just want to comment on that too, because one of the things I hear from teachers I do know a lot of teachers from my previous work is uh, that uh, it, it, we also have inadvertently created sometimes a, a, a burden of data mm -hmm. reporting uh, and it, it kind of grows out somewhat of it I don't think it we did on purpose by any means but if you have to report on you know minuscule you know little uh, indicators uh, too often uh, it, it does create you know an hour two hours of time that we really want teachers working with kids right. and not 
not doing so much and I, I don't know if that's been a problem here but it has been in some others so that's another thing I think we want to work out with this is how do we find those kind of key standards or those or those real uh, uh, summary standards so th so the benchmarks whatever we want to call them so that we're not so that we're not burdening people with, a, with way too much data uh, that and that's a challenge and I think it comes out sometimes in the report cards as I hear people talk about what does this mean and so the you know the idea that a three and a four and that that it creates that even at a microscopic level but also at a larger level so those are challenges we we have to work out just how to do that isn't isn't it possible that we can so I think I'm looking at the law, and it looks to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but I want to clarify it. Is it accurate for me to say that proficiency-based education is not actually the law? That's correct. It's that we need to provide a proficiency-based, a, a, an avenue for a proficiency-based diploma. We certify that students are proficient in the, in, the, in the content areas and the learning results. Right. So it's up to us as a district if we want to go, like, full PBE, which sounds like a disease to me or something, but, um, but or to take pick and choose the aspects about PBE that we like and like bring it, you know, like I've said this before, it's so natural at K-5 to do a PBE education. It's, it's not new. It's been there forever. Take all of the things that we love about that, bring it up, move it up to the high school, take, you know, some other things that we love about different ways of doing it and, and really turn it into something that works for us as a district. Right. That, it's Better a, than just PB, PBE. I think that's been one of the big uh, PBE and PBD are kind of two different things, although they're clearly related. You know, one kind of pulls the other along, uh, and uh, <laughs> the uh, but there are different versions of PBE. Uh, you know, I, I I like to think of it as uh, it's. It, so there are kind of extreme <coughs> versions and there are more modified versions and there are varieties so that's one of the things we're seeing in the field is is people have have <coughs> some very robust uh, and they're very committed to it uh, in fact it becomes almost like a it becomes really serious commitment this is where we're going other places there's a much more uh, and like I said my background is special education uh, Brian talks about his background in CT, <coughs> but proficiency is what we did, what I did as a, as a special ed teacher. It's just how you, you tried to help kids perform tasks at you know, more complex, more rigorous levels that, that, that you could <coughs> make it demonstrate. So, so it isn't even a new idea. It's, it's that we've now, we've now created the ability, I think, to start looking at how do we individualize our uh, it's the opposite of a one-size-fits-all, even though we kind of are saying the system is a one-size-fits-all. But, but it is the opposite of that. It, it is to individualize and to look at individual students' needs. So, but What I like to, um, I visited a number of schools in my district that are well along in this work and have talked to teachers on the front lines about the differences in, in how they approach their work. And I don't know if it's helpful or not, but... Um, I would say the system they were used to um, penalized students for what they didn't know. Um, and give you an example, if you got a 69 in algebra, you failed and you had to take the class over again. And uh, in a performance-based system, you picked up where you left off and then you continued to work on the things that you didn't get. And so when I talk to teachers about what the difference is in the relationship with students under that, um, because you so many you lose so many kids, especially when you we have discussions about algebra two, you can't pass it. You, you know, um, you, you almost could point to that as for a lot of reasons for dropping out. Um, and um, one school system I, I talked with, uh, what they really enjoyed a freshman uh, literature class. Um, they had a set of standards in there, and they had a tracking system of software, and they could track what st what standards the student had met. And if they got to the end of their freshman year and they had met them, the sophomore teacher picked it up. They didn't have to repeat freshman year literature, read the same book again. They just made sure that the sophomore teacher got handed off. And so when I look at those core concepts of that in there, that is, for me, the nuts and bolts of we're not letting kids fall through the cracks. And somebody knows where they are and what they need to know. And, you know, early on in my career, you know, um, 
didn't take me long to kind of ditch the 10% for class participation and some of the other kinds of things that are in <coughs> grades that you average in because that doesn't speak to what a kid a student can knows and is able to do and that's what we really are talking about too is getting away from averaging and saying here are the things that we expect them to know and do can they do those and can you certify that they have done those so um, I think sometimes we get caught up in a lot of the vocabulary and the terminology but it really boils down to those, those four things to me have you looked at any of the data from colleges in regards to kids who need to take remedial classes because for a while there was a lot there was a lot of uh, discussion in regards to kids going off to college and getting there whether it was in state or even out of state um, and they get there and they need to take a math or English remedial class we have and uh, you have sure yeah, great um, we used to uh, collect that data annually uh, from our main institutions of higher ed um, that particular piece of legislation is sunsetted, so it'll take somebody to reintroduce that again. Um, and there's a, a you know a whole host of reasons there. You know, for example, you know the community college system is known for taking students where they are and helping them with remediation and um, and moving them along. But there are others when they would do. Yeah, so I would say all that data helped um, support the initial legislation to um, have a, a diploma that spoke to standards and uh, being proficient in those so that was used to inform that I think it would be a good time to transition to mark I know you prepared a presentation for us um, and then just looking at the time I want to make sure that by 915 we're um, looking at the new business portion of our agenda so that you can make those decisions before they already can be a little quicker I'm gonna try to be much quicker so <clears throat> and I, I do have these folders for all the board members okay. and many of the administrators on the on the team if you wouldn't mind passing those along and sure. Sure. Is it okay if I see you here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, your patience. Thank you for inviting me here. My name is Mark Costin, and as um, Julie mentioned, I'm the associate director of the Great Schools Partnership. We're a nonprofit organization that's based in Portland, Maine. Check your connection. Are you plugged in tight? Obviously not proficient in this technology. Um, I make. So I'll, keep, I'll, I'll keep going here, but I, I may. Um, I just was counting this off. I will be starting my 30th year in education in a couple of, in, in September. So I'm a lifelong educator as well. And um, I spent time as a high school teacher in Montreal and Toronto, as a school administrator in Vermont, as a professor of, of teacher education, where my candidates, my teacher candidates, were involved in a proficiency-based system for candidacy. Um, and then for the last 15 years, I've, been, I've had the privilege of working with um, wonderful colleagues at the Great Schools Partnership in Portland. We are a nonprofit support organization that is mission driven, that works with over 100 school districts across the country who are dedicated and committed to ensuring that all of their students are known well, supported, um, and when they graduate are ready for whatever decisions they and their families um, decide is the next step. And uh, we're very committed to ensuring that um, the work that we do and the work that we support is really in service of students. The other thing that's important to understand and realize for us is that we are not proponents of any one particular approach or any one particular model. So just as every student is unique and different, possesses different needs, learns in different ways, has their own assets and their own, own challenges and interests, we feel the very same way that each of the school districts and schools and educators with whom we work 
requires uh, ensuring that we know them, understand them, and, and determine what the best course of action for that particular district and school is. So our approach to supporting um, overall school improvement is really context-based and context-specific. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why proficiency um, education and really sort of just put it in the context of proficiency education, proficiency-based education in and of itself isn't, a, isn't an intervention. We think of proficiency-based educa education really as a suite of best practices and supports and instructional pedagogical ap approaches, supports and interventions, assessment and feedback and learning opportunities that are steeped in um, and grounded in support in the literature. And it's one of several approaches and strategies that need to be in place in high-performing school districts that support their students. So um, without the context of professional learning groups, without uh, a shared vision, without a shared leadership, without looking at data, without crafting uh, long-term strategic plans, um, without all of those elements in place, any particular initiative such as proficiency-based education is not going to be successful. So I think it's really important to make sure that when we think about your journey and your emphasis in engaging in proficiency-based education, it's really about making sure that we're informing and supporting the teaching and learning process. So let me just take a pause here because I may need to shift gears. Um, I wanted to walk through, I'll, ju I'll just leave this up, it's okay, I can, we'll, we'll switch and adjust. I wanted to walk through um, some of the pieces that I shared with you in the packet. I guess the one thing I want to do first before we go to grading is just talk a little bit about um, what are the core beliefs and practices from our perspective that support and inform proficiency-based education. And so in your packets on the right-hand side, um, what I've shared with you is um, from our perspective, again, this is our learned ex experience perspective and working with hundreds of districts across the country who have elected to engage in and, in and implement aspects of proficiency-based education. These are the core beliefs and some of the important practices that will ensure its success. So the four core areas are about the learning environment, about the outcomes, around assessment and feedback, and the fourth piece is around learning pathways, sometimes referred to as multiple or flexible pathways or, or learner agency. So all students can, we, it, it's important to ensure that all students can, to, to know and believe that all students can and will learn when they feel included, respected, and valued by their learning community. So, it's, so first and foremost, much as what we've heard this evening and what I know so far from, from uh, my conversations with leaders in, in the district, um, students are, are known well. They're, um, w when they're known well, feel safe and respected and valued as, as part of the community, they're going to develop develop positive relationships with one another, with their teachers, um, and with the adults in the learning community <coughs> to be successful. The curriculum, classroom structures of the school recognize and honor the different identities and interests. This is all about ensuring that every student is an individual, much, as though, much in the way that you suggested earlier. So um, first and foremost, that learning environment needs to ensure that we recognize and value that aspect, that every student is, is an individual. The second <coughs> belief is around students need to be challenged, believed in, and supported to reach common high expectations. This is the piece where we take a strong stance, at least organizationally, and we, and we uh, engage in conversations with partners with whom we work about, listen, we don't know what the, what the future holds for students. We don't know what challenges. We don't know what jobs. We don't know what learning opportunities exist. So it's up to us as a community to identify and determine what we value most and believe is most important for the graduates of our district so that whenever they graduate or when they graduate, they are ready for the rigors and challenges and to be successful in whatever their pursuits are. So this is where the piece around local control is essential, and it's also the piece around where definitions and determinations of the skills and the knowledge um, and what students can and should be able to do um, is critical and important. And we would also argue, and we know through conversations, that 
um, what are so-called 21st century skills. Vermont calls them transferable skills. Maine calls them guiding principles. You may have also NEASC accreditation, um, 21st century learning outcomes. Those, those particular skills are becoming increasing, in, increasingly value, valuable and probably the, the most highly rated currency of a high school diploma. So I'm talking about collaboration, communication, problem solving, perseverance, um, time management, um, use of use of technology and critical thinking. So those are what are referred to as 21st century or guiding principles or transferable skills. And we would argue that it is impossible to teach, to provide feedback, to report, and to determine how well students do over time on those kinds of skills in the absence of a performance-based, proficiency-based system. You can't do a paper, pass, uh, a paper pencil test to determine the extent to which students collaborate. These are things that we need to see students doing in, act in action over time. They're things that we need to make sure that, that are communicated to students, that they receive support and practice, that they're provided with feedback on their collaboration and their communication, and that we're reporting accurately and consistently and meaningfully in terms of how well students are doing on those. We would also argue then, just as there are curricular skills that are cross-curricular, there are core concepts and knowledge and skills within each of the disciplines. So science and math and world language and visual and performing arts, et cetera. So the, the outcomes aspect of a proficiency-based system are critical, and we believe we, we can't truly know how well students are meeting the locally determined expectations in the absence of a system that embraces and supports performance-based, proficiency-based assessments. The, th the third environment is around assessment and feedback. The literature is replete with references about the importance of ongoing, formative, just-in-time, um, encouraging and incentivizing um, um, actionable feedback and um, it is essential that the educators in a learning community are provided with time and support and shared definitions of what success looks like and an opportunity to practice um, and, in, and increase their own sense of assessment literacy by designing assessments that are aligned to those expectations and by also providing um, accurate and consistent judgment and feedback to students. So that if when I'm a student I'm receiving feedback, it's important that I know where I stand against the standard, that I know exactly what I need to do differently, and that I have a reporting and, and um, an assessment and a reporting system that incentivizes and encourages me to continue to grow and allows me to strive. So, so that's another sort of core element of proficiency-based um, education that is essential um, for the kinds of preparedness that we're looking for. And then finally, um, getting back to the notion of students having different needs, different, in different interests, different specific um, uh, areas where they, where they struggle and they need to continue to engage in, in um, more support, and also opportunities to learn both within the building and then outside of the building in order to ensure that whatever those personalized learning opportunities are, are actually equitable and will lead to the same kinds of expectations <coughs> and a consistent, a consistent way of determining the degree to which students have met them, we, that needs to be grounded in a proficiency-based system. Otherwise, when we personalize learning in the absence of a proficiency-based education system, we end up personalizing standards, and that will, uh, that will lead us right back to the sort of the bifurcated system where, we have, we, where we're asking students, uh, we're expecting of students different things. And in the 21st century, that's inequitable. We want to make sure that if you have decided as a community what your expectations are for all students so that they're ready, then we need to make sure that we have a system that supports and encourages students taking different pathways, but that also has that consistent definition of success that teachers can use to help co-create pathways with students and use those criteria to ensure that, that their judgment and evaluation of student work is clear, it's consistent, and it demonstrates exactly what a student has, can learn and, can, and be able to do. So that's the, the sort of the foundational aspect of proficiency-based education. I'm going to fast forward over everything else and go straight to reporting. Um, and so on the left-hand side, 
on the left hand side of your packet, we have provided just one example of a proficiency based transcript. Um, I mentioned we work with well over 100 districts across the country. Every district that we work with is engaged in some element of proficiency-based education. There are 13 states across the country where we work where proficiency or competency-based education is not statutorily required. These are schools and districts through their visioning process that have determined that proficiency-based education is one of the components of their improvement plan that will help them ensure increased readiness. And so when we work with them, and we help them sort of advise them on how to create a how to create a reporting system the first thing we say is make sure that your reporting system reflects the values and vision of your of what what you expect for, for students and, and your learning in your learning system we want to make sure that the vision drives and informs the reporting system not the reporting system driving and informing the vision so that's the first piece the second piece is there are lots of ways to convey how students have have learned what they've accomplished, what they've demonstrated, how they've distinguished themselves. And at, in it, at its core, whether we're, we're looking at um, letters or numbers, a scale that is 1 to 100, a scale that is 1 to 6 or 1 to 4, or symbols or narratives, at, at its essence, a report card is essentially a collection of symbols that is intended to convey what a student has accomplished and learned. And so it's important for a school district to think about what is it that we want to convey with our report card and what is the best way, what are the best symbols to use. Um, I'll just point out in that, in that sample transcript that we worked with a number of years ago, guidance counselors, high school principals, um, two and four year and public and private admissions officers across the state and we spent a year sort of developing um, guidelines, attributes um, and exemplars and this was the exemplar that, that we created. This is just one way to do it. Um, the guidance that we had was two pages, um, make, it, make it short, there are some things that are really important. Um, uh, prospective employers and admissions officers uh, and post-secondary learning uh, admissions officers look at a whole host of transcripts, make it straightforward, make it clear, make it short, um, and you'll see on our transcript sample there are a couple of things that are distinguishing it. The first page is essentially a listing of the learning experiences that the student took by year. So we're still retaining year by year courses experiences. We're still indicating whether or not in certain courses they were AP, online, had an honors challenge, were an internship, were a research project, were a dual enrollment. It's really important to think of the transcript as the vehicle by which you want Scarborough High School graduate graduates to distinguish themselves and ensure that they have the most viable and best candidacy possible, whether they're seeking employment or seeking admission to post-secondary learning. So there are elements that I think that are important to, to maintain. You'll see that um, the differentiation on this one is that this school is using a four-point scale. So that four-point scale essentially represents the average proficiency of all of the standards that have been addressed in that course. So if you receive a 3.75 for a course, what that 3.75 means is it's an average of all of the standards that a student has demonstrated proficiency in during the course. So it's not 100, 1 to 100, it's not A through D, it's 1 through 4, but it's essentially how well that student did against all of the standards in that, in that course. The other thing that's on the first page is you'll see there's a box towards the bottom, I believe, where it indicates how that student has done over the course of their career at that high school on each of the five guiding principles. So clear and effective communication, um, problem solving, et cetera. And then the second page, um, you'll see this is a little bit different from a traditional transcript or for stu or a school that's not standards based. And in this particular instance, what we're doing is illustrating the overall proficiency achieved on each of the standards for each of the eight content areas. So English, I believe, has five in this instance. There are five core graduation standards. Um, so you can see over time, over the course of that student's four-year period, if it's a four-year uh, graduate, you'll see how they did uh, proficiency-wise on all of the standards. This will be important to convey in the profile because you'll want to make sure your profile says 
These are our standards. These are our core line in the sand graduation standards for our graduates in all of these content areas. And this transcript demonstrates how well that student has done on all of those standards. So again, page one, how we did course by course or experience by experience and page two, how we did against all of the standards. And then lastly, or cut to one more um, uh, piece that I'll say, and that is um, colleges are accustomed to, we heard from admissions officers, to a grade point average. Um, and we heard from them a suggestion that you, again, try to keep it as familiar as possible. And while it may not necessarily mean the same thing or calculated the same way, there is um, an overall cumulative standards-based grade point average that is presented in that, in that transcript. So in other words, a student still gets, still could end up with a, a standards-based GPA of 3.93, um, but that standards-based GPA is essentially um, <coughs> an index of how that student did on all of the standards. Right? It's still, st still standards-based, it's still four-point scale, it's still a GPA. Um, and then in this one, we've encouraged the implementation and use of a Latin honor system. Again, something that's very familiar with uh, what colleges and universities use across the country. So summa, magna, and cum laude um, have sort of different designations. I'll stop there, and I think it's probably best for, for questions, but I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the materials that I've shared with you and just underscore the fact that um, again, proficiency-based education is one of many other important strategies that are essential for high-performing schools to have in place to meet the needs of all of their students, and that um, the vision for learning in a proficiency-based system really needs to guide the design of the transcript and support of a school profile. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other schools in Maine that you work with? Uh, like the, the districts mm. where we are. Um, I'll start by probably closest. Uh, Trape, York, Bonnie Eagle, um, uh, Portland, Westbrook, uh, Nokomis, um, uh, Oxford Hills. Those are, just to, to, to name a few, I think there's about 35 or so that, with whom we work. And again, all of them are doing, at different places, doing slightly different different ways that best are sort of grounded in, in the desires and, and, and vision of their district. Does anyone else have any questions? I, I just, um, like in this like example of a transcript, I was just curious, like it shows like, you know, three, 3.5, four, that kind of thing. In this, in this example, is there a way to get like a, you said something about a 3.93. So, so in this example, or do you have schools that, that grade you know, in interval, like in small intervals, not going 3.25 to 3.5, yeah. but you know. Yeah, the, the 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 transcript of the report card will eventually have probably more than just increments of zero and 0 0.5, um, because because essentially you're made up of a string. You may have in the uh, reading comprehension, for example, uh, standard that a student has probably has had. I don't know maybe 25 at least significant summative assessment attempts over the course of their four years, each with progressively sophisticated um, and increasingly rigorous content around reading comprehension. So in all likelihood, their level of proficiency when we calculate it at the end, create an index, would probably be like 3.13. So there would be that level of, of um, specificity or increased detail. Mm -hmm. But I think you're asking about when you actually receive a grade. You're not going to receive oh, a 3.12. You're, you're going to receive a 3. Or right, I'm sorry. B, Did you mean individual five. assessments or final yes, reporting? Yes, I guess like on individual assessments, because I know it seems, yeah. you know, that, that seems to be in the proficiency world that I've seen, it seems yeah. to be, you know, the increments are what, 3 to 3.5 and not, you know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if, if different schools are doing it differently where they are saying, oh, okay, you know, mm -hmm. measuring most, it out. Most schools use, a, most schools you work with use a four-point scale. Typically that's, that's the most common that we see. Um, if there are, so, there are a handful that have added gradations in, bequ in between the integers, so, um, <coughs> 
but that doesn't necessarily happen for the whole scale. You might have a 1, a 2, a 3, a 3.5, and a 4 that's possible. <laughs> What's important to understand is that when we work with schools or schools that are doing this, um, the standards get unpacked as performance indicators. So the standards are broader statements, like reading comprehension is a broader statement, um, or argumentation is a broader statement. Um, the, the un, what, what you use to assess a piece of student work, just looking at argumentation, would be two or three performance indicators from which we would then build out <laughs> scoring criteria. And those might include you know, presentation, language, grammatical sort of sentence structure to logical presentation and compelling, uh, compelling aspect of the argument to um, how those arguments are grounded in the research. So if we're all writing a persuasive essay, our overall paper grade is going to be based on all three of those, and we would have different descriptions or criteria. So that if Senator Langley and I are receive are doing this this paper, um, I know that he would do well in terms of compelling argument. I might not do well uh, on on the piece, right? So so it'd be important that level of specificity for us to know what to do better, um, as it would also be important for the educators to know if a student is struggling. If I'm struggling. Um, and I need some additional support, I know that I'm struggling with um, uh, presentation and construction of sentences, not um, development of a compelling argument. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. uh, may I <coughs> move to suspend the rules on policy BE to extend our meeting beyond the time of 9.30? I put that in the form of a motion. Second. Anyone have any, any questions or concerns about extending? <laughs> the rule is, for the general public too, the rule is that we can't take new business after 9.30, so Jackie's asking if we can delay that um, time frame. Extend the time extend, frame. Yep. Right. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, seven. I want to finish the agenda tonight. <laughs> do you so typically... Do do you typically find that it works well to have, if you have a separate middle school and, so for example, we have a separate middle school and a, and a separate high school. They're two different schools and right now they have two different grading systems. Mm. Um, do you generally find that it's, a, that, it, that it works more smoothly in a district to have those more aligned? That's a good, that's a good question. I, part of it depends on the genesis of that reporting system. You know, there are legacy systems that are in place in districts that we see, and I think as, as Paul mentioned earlier, um, we tend to see school districts that have a high degree of familiarity and practice with a standards-based grading system, grading system, and certainly we see that K through five. Sometimes we see it, see it in middle school. Some school districts, districts, for, for example, that we work with in Vermont, may have started in the middle school first. So it's not uncommon earlier on to see slight differences. I think what's critical is ultimately they're, they're, you've got to have some kind of framework that guides or informs or sort of a standard, if you will, um, to make sure that you know uh, these are the things we want our, our grading and reporting system to do and a check on is are we accomplishing it? If these are our expectations, how well is our system K-5, middle school, and high school doing it? Um, certainly, I think the greater level of coherence you can, the greater level of consistency you can, and the other thing that's important to, to remember is, um, you know, I, I have three children. Um, many of us have multiple children, and it's, and not only does every student experience different grading schemes or different grading opportunities in the classes that they have, but families have multiple um, grading opportunities or report cards. And uh, it's really important to ensure that there's some level of, of, of consistency. But I go back to what the framework is and the guiding, sort of your guiding stars for your system and, and check on that. Anyone else? No, please. Thank you very much. Actually, actually I have. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to, I'm really concerned about um, how we may or may, may or may not be putting our, our high school students at a disadvantage mm -hmm. by not having a GPA. Um, well, I mean, I know we do right now with the hybrid system, but if we ever move to something beyond that, um, I feel like without the GPA, you know, all these things are, and it's not just admissions, right? It's like scholarships, mm -hmm. NCAA, NCAA 
uh, eligibility, like all of the, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, the resource that, that I shared with you, I mean, there was a reason we engaged in that year-long process of um, what is, as we shift, as, as Maine and, and schools across the country shift to a proficiency system, what are the best ways to ensure that students are best positioned for candidacy? So that, that's, that's the reason why we kept, um, you know, we slightly altered it and we describe it in the school profile, but there still is a, there still is a GPA. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that's important. I mean, it's, it's a, it, one of the things that we heard loudly and clearly from admissions officers was you need to understand that this is how you are presenting your candidates, your graduates for candidacy here. And the, it's incumbent upon you as a district to present them in the best possible, life, uh, possible light, be accurate, be fair, um, and describe what the meaning is. Because admissions officers also need to know about um, the rigor and richness um, of the students' experiences. You know, how have they? <laughs> Can I start again? So I'm sorry. That's a longer-winded way of saying it's the reason why we kept it in there. We, we've recently had some uh, conversations with admissions people from our the education committee. One of our uh, representative Purse, um, who's from Falmouth. Um, and came back and uh, and reported back uh, to our uh, committee after having gone to a conference with admissions uh, folks. Um, believe it or not, they uh, you know Stanford will have 4,000 applicants with 4.0 averages for 1,500 slots. So there are other things that they obviously that they'll be looking at, and they're very much aware of how how um, uh, transcripts are padded. My daughter took band all four years because it was an A every time, and so she could help uh, pad her GPA. So admissions folks are very adept um, at figuring out um, uh, the GPA thing as to uh, uh, as to what it really means when they put their and their folks together. So. Um, we, we, what it came back to us is that the school profile is the number one thing that they really take a look at um, before they look at the transcripts. So, other piece, just one last thing. We've worked with a number of districts for whom the admissions piece was a concern. My recommendation is begin the process of thinking through the redesign of your transcript and profile and start calling folks. You've got wonderful relationships, it sounds like, with many, many colleges and universities. Once you've sort of determined what it is you're thinking of doing, um, get on the phone, call them, meet with them. In our experience, every time this has happened in communities um, and you have an opportunity to uh, explain what the, what the what the transcript is and through the profile you get wonderfully rich information and and you'll find that folks are really amenable uh, under under particular sort of um, you know ideas around and they'll give you some wonderful ways to sort of think about the the continuing design of your transcript and what you need to do again to position your kids your graduates well uh, when they candidate somewhere so what I hear you saying is there's the value of these two things being in tandem, mm -hmm. the school profile with yes. the transcript. Absolutely. And the, the other, on Monday, we had a meeting with um, members of the high school ILT and um, Robin Palmer, who is our senior placement officer, was there. And we were talking, we looked at some of these examples and we were talking about even ad adapting possibly something like the transcript sample you see, um, but adding that column for the 0 to 100 score. And how, would, how does that affect our profile and how would we communicate that? So the high school guidance department is currently working working on developing a draft transcript that they're going to bring back to the group to review. And I would just ask if when we post the minutes for this meeting that maybe we can include you know, mm -hmm. these examples just so people can see them because mm -hmm. they're all wondering what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So if we can post pictures and... I can send them electronically if that's yeah. helpful. Oh, that would be great. I can yeah, that would do that be perfect. tomorrow or Monday. I, yeah, I think one of the things that colleges um, look for, you know, when... Um, Senator uh, brought up about um, 4,000 students and they all have 1,500, uh, they all have a GPA, you know, or an A and uh, there's only 1,500 slots. They're looking to see what else kids have done Absolutely. in colleges and capstone projects and things like that. Those are things that we have to develop and uh, get going because those that's what's happening. A lot of schools, they're very competitive and it's not just your GPA, but what else have you done mm -hmm. to enhance that GPA um, to get into those schools? Right, and that's more and more the case, I think. Yeah. It, it was when I, but 
but I don't want to I don't want to disadvantage anyone by not having that GPA in addition to all those other things that they're no, asking for. No, no, we have, the, we have the right. GPA. So I just, just say that's that all one I'm of the things we need to the, yeah. continue working on are the experiences yeah. that they can list and show that enhance their GPA and get their transcript to be right. more um, stand out. And I mean, really, Mark, like this, so this is another question. I mean, one through four is an arbitrary way of, of assigning a proficiency grade to any of these standards, right? I mean, we could do A through D or, mm -hmm. right, I mean, so, uh, right, okay. Yeah. That's all, I, I just wanted to point that out, that like one, one, two, three, four isn't any different than, you know, banana, apple, orange, pineapple, or. As long as it has meaning. The right. one thing that's different is the equal intervals. So you're not having, like with a zero to 100 scale, one of the challenges is that you have more opportunities to fail than you do to succeed. So you know, zero through whatever, depending on the school system, can be a failing grade. But then when it, to be successful, the increments are so much closer to that. I know, but you, uh, yeah. The I can see th provides a solution for that. It's the, well, all I'm saying is, like, if my kid got a two, she would think she failed. So I don't see how that's any really different than, like, zero, you know, if she got a 50. But. Anyone else? No? Thank you very much, all of you, for sticking with us. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. So we will move on to um, new business. 7.1 is the first reading of school board policy IDR instructional day regulations. Do I have a motion? I have a motion. I'd like to amend policy IDR to correspond to the compromise start times, which was. First, first we have to. You have oh. to that's okay. No, you're good. We I just have to put this one I into knew. motion so then you okay. can make an amendment if you would like to. So I'm having trouble hearing you folks tonight. So what do I motion then? Uh, so moved. Okay, so moved. So is, there, is there a second? Second. second. Okay. So discussion on uh, policy IDR. I would like to uh, offer an amendment, please. Okay. Okay, I'll come to you, too. <laughs> My amendment, <coughs> excuse me, please, is this, uh, that the school instructional time periods uh, be amended to uh, start times of 8.50 for children in grades K through 5 and start time for the middle school and the high school be 8 a.m. The ending time for K-5 would be 3.15 and the ending time for the high school would be 225. And middle school. Yeah, six, uh, middle school and high school. <coughs> That's what I said, okay. yes. Okay, is that in the form of a motion? Or are you making That's an amendment okay. to the motion, yes. All right, discussion? Go ahead. Everybody who was sitting here last year knows that that I was not happy with with the dramatic change in start times and I think that <coughs> excuse me please that this compromise uh, although it's not perfect and although I do believe in the science especially for the high school I do believe uh, that in the best interest of our students uh, they don't need the turmoil that this has caused. And uh, so I think it is in the best interest of our students and everybody else concerned that I offer this amendment. Anyone else have comments on the amendment? I have three pages worth of comments. <laughs> have at it. Sorry. Um, so I had a similar amendment. That's what's basically the same thing I was going to say. I actually have, um, actually I'll do that later. <clears throat> um, so anyone, I mean, I've only been on for three months and if you knew me before that time, you knew that I was already a proponent of doing a compromise. It's something I've been interested in for a long time. Um, I, I just want to make it clear that I understand the science behind um, having a start time at 8.30 or later for the older kids. Um, and I, I don't discount it, but 
I also think that you, it, we don't live in a vacuum. We don't just live in a science lab. So we need to view it through the lens of our own community and also the rest of the area in which we live. Um, you know, our cohort, other schools, and um, everything that everything else that happens in our area. Um, I know that, that that's not going to alleviate any disappointment that a lot of people have who um, really feel strongly that the adolescents should start at, after 8.30, but I still feel like 8 o'clock is better than 7.35. Um, recently, somebody gave, <laughs> had an analogy, which was that um, you know your doctor may recommend that you have three to five servings of vegetables per day, but um, if you can't get that, two is still better than none. So I feel like that's that's what I'm trying to say. With you know eight o'clock is better than seven thirty, um, and um, the other thing I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention is I had I have about thirty eight case studies here of districts that have moved to a later time. Um, about fifty five percent of them, so twenty one of them, um, changed their time, but still were not able to start at 8.30 or later. They started somewhere between 7.50 and 8.29, I guess. Um, and they all still reported a positive change um, and, and outcomes that were benefit uh, beneficial to their students. Um, so, you know, I think there is still going to be some benefit. I know it might not be as much as what we originally thought uh, or what we would originally have anticipated with 8.30. Um, and I also just want to say that um, the document that you sent out, the last document you sent out, that had the all the metrics that we'll be using to judge whether this is um, a positive change or however that may be, I, I don't want to stop that. I want to continue with that because even though I'm not interested in having like a dramatic change every year, I don't think that this, this is my personal opinion, I don't think that it should be static either because if we're finding that, you know, we're looking at this and it's a really positive change and we can move it 10 minutes next year to either make, um, you know, the, the elementary school start 10 minutes earlier or the high school start 10 minutes later, however that might be, like, I feel like we should look into that on a regular basis and just make sure that we're constantly using that data in a positive way and um, for, you know, for, every, for as many kids as we can. Okay, third page. Um, so the other thing is I just want to, I just want to apologize for, um, because I am sorry for people who have made plans based on what they thought was going to happen and I know that, that this is going to be another change and it's going to be a further challenge to, um, to change your schedule yet again. Um, and I know that the time frame for this is going to be shorter for, for all of you guys to try and work something out. But what I was hearing from the meeting on Monday was that a lot of the challenges that are the things that are going to be um, the biggest changes, such as um, having your, your doors open 20 minutes before school and 20 minutes after school, and um, maybe some of the drop-off and pickup procedures, particularly at the elementary schools, those have already been in the works, and um, you, you're well on the road to getting those um, problems solved. So I feel like this making this compromise doesn't necessarily, it's not going to negate the work you've done, and you can just kind of keep adding on to it. I also hear that the um, K-5 to, you know, this is 8.50 is not an ideal time for K-5 students to start, in your opinion. Um, and I certainly respect your opinion as the people who work with them every day. Um, but I just, I feel personally that leaving no change for them um, will allow them to get the sleep they need. And like I said, I want to continue to look and see, like, can we push it, you know, can we move it further to what your ideal time would be, like, a little bit at a time. Um, so the advantages I see of having a compromise are that it eliminates and or reduces a lot of the problems that we have had with after school activities, um, including sports at the middle school and the high school. Um, it retains crew and A East at the optimal time, um, which I've heard from students and teachers alike that is that's they, they don't want it at the end of the day. Um, it allows for families who use older children to watch younger children to continue doing that. It gives more flexibility for our high school students who have jobs um, to maintain jobs or have um, a larger, um, have more opportunities. Um, it maintains a schedule which allows the youngest students to get the most, the 
who need the most sleep to get more sleep. Um, it aligns better with uh, all the other schools in our cohort. It takes pressure off of aftercare and the overcrowding that they're seeing, and it allows for um, the vocational students to um, uh, have no changes in their schedule. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, actually, I have a question. Sorry. Okay. Before we, um, so I had a question for um, the, any any of the leadership team who's here. So I thought it was, I know it was highly unusual, but I thought it was very helpful that um, board members went to um, talk to the teachers and kind of find out how they felt because this, <coughs> this is a big change. Um, you know, not all of us went to every session, but we all took notes and we shared those notes between us and I just thought it was really helpful. In the effort, in the, in the interest of not having this drag on, I don't feel like we're in a position to do that again. So I'm asking you, what is your level of confidence in if, this, if the compromise plan happened? What is your level of conf confidence that your teachers are supporting this or would support this? support this so I can speak to that Hillary um, which is I really wanted to have an opportunity tonight to advocate which I'm sure is already on your radar to really consider the timing of this decision no matter what the decision is um, and I understand it's a really delicate balance but just to share the perspective of a really of a large and busy school so we um, met with you on Monday evening and that was our responsibility of the Leadership Council to discuss with you these three options and um, then on Tuesday, we had a snow day. And then on Wednesday, we had a snow day. Right. And then today and tomorrow, in our um, very valuable and precious professional development time, we're preparing our um, staff members to be proctors for the MEA. There's like a mandatory MEA proctor training. So there have literally <coughs> been zero minutes this week to have a conversation with the staff about um, about these proposed options. There's been a digital communication, but we haven't had that really important and valuable face-to-face -face time with the staff members. So I understand it's a really delicate balance. Like we need to move forward, reach a decision for planning purposes so that the community can figure out childcare and all the logistics that go with it, regardless of what decision is made. But I think allowing for adequate time for staff to process and provide input, <coughs> input and feedback is paramount in this decision. Um, Julie said the other night, no matter what the reasons or plans, community readiness matters, and like our, our teachers are a huge and important part of our community. Um, so Wentworth has been, you know, quietly chugging along and planning and getting our plans set for the 1819 start times. Um, and we've been doing that, you know, <coughs> problem solving and wishes and wonders. Um, but that planning has only included one out of the three options that have been put forth to you today. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned about the aggressive timeline. I just think that it's a delicate balance because to your point, having those conversations, I, I can't speak to what I think that the, the buy-in of my staff will be. I can guess, and I know that they're amazing problem solvers and that we opened a school and we had like you know, 48 hours to do that and we did it and they were great. Um, so I know that they'll champion whatever has to happen, but I think it's really important that we have some time to have those conversations. So um, that's what I would advocate for. May I so point out that this is a first reading on the policy? Correct. <coughs> so what I hear is that this is the first reading. It's happening obviously tonight, but um, before we get to a second reading, you're asking for extra time just a little bit of time yeah to have the totally conversations understand. with the staff and yeah. so that, that we and that's what I there. like that's why I asked because I want to mm -hmm. know what the buy-in will be from from faculty and staff does Did anyone else to high school and middle school? I think you know we talked about this on Monday and I would probably say that Kelly's staff is going to incur the largest shift in terms of the change mm -hmm. Um, you know, for, for us at the middle school, it's a 15 minute change from where we currently are at. And so I think from a staff perspective, um, people feel really comfortable with that because, you know, the, it really shouldn't shift a lot of personal plans or commitments because it is so minor in terms of, you know, what we had been considering when we were looking at a nine o'clock start time that really would have been a significant change. Okay. I think I would echo the same for the high school 
and I base that largely on the listing tour that a couple of the board members were involved in. I think it was a, week, a month ago today, in fact. My sense in that meeting is that our staff would support the compromise, but that's my sense. I like what Kelly has to say as far as having some time for staff to process that out loud at a meeting in some way, shape, or form. I think that's very wise, but based on my experience in that meeting, Sue was there for a little bit too if she wants to talk, but my sense was that they would support a compromise. Um, Speaking for K2, uh, we're going to support whatever decision is made. Uh, you know, we have the least amount of change to look forward to in the sense of start time, if either way. So if you, unless you continue with the plan to change everything, but the compromise or continuing where we are right now, we have little little change to our what's on paper for start time. What the two-tiered system would do was to change what happens in between the start and the end time because our buses will be there more likely on time and our kids will arrive more likely in in a in a in a better fashion in a more um, predictable fashion and they will be picked up in a more predictable right. way in fashion. So what happens in between those those two time frames, whether it's eight o'clock or eight fifty. 225 or 315 that's where our opportunities lie um, and quite honestly we can apply all the work that we've done to whatever time you give us to start with because we can say look we've done all this great work we've done all this great talking we've great done all this planning we've looked at what happens between beginning and end of the day and we can apply whatever that is to whichever time you're giving us because we know that our kids are going to be there if we go to the two-tier system right. we can predict that our kids will be there mm -hmm. in a more predictable time mm -hmm. if we stay where we are we know what we're getting right. <laughs> we've lived it for many many years so that's you know not which not is difficult which you have said though is not ideal because you you have buses coming in you can't start at 8 50 and and you have kids okay. waiting for a half an hour in the classrooms after yeah. It's not ideal, but our teachers do an amazing job of yeah. making every minute count. Mm -hmm. So whether that kid comes in at 8.50 and is the first child in the room, or they're there until 8.35 uh, and they're the last kid in the room, mm -hmm. they're making that time count. So okay. uh, yeah. I think our teachers will do whatever they need to do to make it, make it valuable time. I think one of the points that I want to make, and I, I understand that this is first reading, but the timing between first and second reading, because it may seem like, oh, well, there's a week to, to process, or even two weeks, right, but, but you don't have but, that. But That's a week just long. goes zip, right. zip, 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 and throw in a couple of snow days and, you know, mandated training and... So what's um, a reasonable... Parent teacher conferences and parent teacher and parent report cards and going home and, and two 90-minute yeah. staff meetings. Everything, so everything continues yeah. on even though we have right. this really big topic right. to so process So what's a through? reasonable amount of time where you think you would get a, a good sense of where your staff is? in terms of this well, like, so just tell me on the next schedule board meeting isn't until April 5th right, right? and so that 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 feels kind of far out um, but I think a week is not enough so, okay. so somewhere <laughs> so, between March, March, so like March 29th is two weeks from today <sighs> well, what's March April 29th? 5th is three weeks mm -hmm. from today oh. crazy healthy kids yeah. with March 29th. Oh, yeah. March excuse 29th. me yeah there, there's a motion okay. right is a motion on the table. Right. We can move on to yep. other things after we address the motion. Well, actually, it's the amendment. Um, right. the Does anyone else have any comments on the amendment? Um, I have a, oh, go for it. Okay. I have a few comments. First, um, Hillary, thank you. You checked off most of my uh, comments. <laughs> um, and I did read all the science, and I've read a bunch of differing opinions. But I think it comes down to some priorities, and I'm going to use my son as the example. Um, all summer long, he was in bed before 9.30 because he was getting ready for football. He knew what he had to do, and he made a point of getting enough sleep so that he could be productive on the field. And even all winter, 8 o'clock on Friday nights, so he could wrestle. I think that kids make do. Um, if they need to get more sleep, they're going to make sure it happens. 
And I argue with him every Tuesday night when it's a late start that just because it's an hour and a half later doesn't mean you stay up an hour and a half later. I think that you know they're going to get to sleep. They're going to do what they need. The 8 o'clock works really well as far as giving them a little extra time. Um, I am concerned, though, about saying incremental changes. I want to make sure that we know what the success criteria are, that we have enough buses, we have enough time to plan for this, and make sure that we are fully prepared before we come back to say later start times, making sure that we know what the impact will be sports-wise, what is the impact for the kid, the younger kids going earlier, that we're not asking anybody to be at a bus at 7 o'clock in the morning that we can make sure that it works. I don't want to see us here again in you know, a year, two years, having the same sort of discussion with the community. I think it's unfair to the teachers, the students, and all of us. Um, and then the last thing with K-5, I think the sleep is so important. Kelly, you and I were on a fast track to being best friends um, <laughs> with as much time as he spent in your office. And once we realized there was an issue with his sleep, and we were able to correct it, he had sleep, ap sleep apnea, and we stopped talking. I don't want to see your office be filled with a bunch of children because they're not getting the sleep that they need. So I'm really an advocate for the compromise. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, so I guess I want to... Um, emphasize that when I talk when I've talked in the past about the time that we've put into this it's not about a sunk cost fallacy and it's not about ego it's about the more you look at this issue the more it becomes clear that it's a really important public health issue and um, and I think that this week is actually an interesting time to talk about this it's daylight savings week right we're all still a little bit feeling the effect of losing that one hour of sleep and that's what kids in the these adolescent kids are feeling every week but times five. <coughs> and I wonder how much of that um, stereotype of the sullen, moody teenager would go away if these kids were getting the right amount of sleep. Um, so it's, it's more about the urgency to me um, <coughs> to, to do something about this problem. Um, as to the three options that we're talking about, I, I can't, in good conscience, vote again for those kids to be going to school at 35 anymore. I did that last year, to, and it was painful to, to take that year, um, to take this year, um, to, to try to get all the implementation right. Um, so I can't, I can't vote to do nothing. Um, but it's really, it, it's really hard for me to vote for them to start before 8.30. Um, given all that we know. Um, a quote that I keep coming back to is from uh, Matt Walker. He's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley, director of sleep and neuroimaging laboratory. He has a new book out called Why We Sleep. And this quote from an interview with him just keeps ringing in my mind. He says, if you fight against biology, usually you, you lose. If our goal as educators <coughs> truly is to educate and not risk lives in the process, then we are failing our children in a quite spectacular manner with this model of early school start times. And I'm sorry I get emotional, but um, a lot has gone into this. And I, on the other hand, I hear, Jackie, what you're saying with your amendment that um, the environment in this town right now also is not healthy for children. Um, and we can't ignore that either. So. Um, uh, in most towns, I wanted to point out um, that the push to change school start times comes from a group of parents, students, and sometimes teachers. Uh, they usually develop a grassroots effort, and they try to convince the Board of Education to make this change in support of student health. Um, and here you have a board willing to make this change, and um, uh, I admire and, ad and I respect all these elementary parents who are advocating for their kids' sleep health. I, I totally get it. Um, I, I'm not crazy about a 7 a.m. bus time for kids, uh, absolutely. I, um, I do think that 8.50 is really late for those kids to start. I do wish we could do something about that. Um, and I hope that these parents, when their kids in three or four years get to be adolescents that I, I hope that they are also looking at this research and and I hope that that you find that whoever is on the board at that point that they are willing to hear um, and respond um, uh, 
Uh, I guess that's it for now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, um, I just wanted to start out with just apologizing for being late because I was, my daughter was in the middle school. Excuse me, Mary, I can't hear Oh, I'm sorry. You. My voice is not, it's not okay, carrying well. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, so I apologize for being late because my daughter is in the seventh grade band at the wonderful middle school and they got to perform the national anthem at the Red Claws. Right. So I went to see her perform and then I came right here. But I just want to assure you that I will watch the comments, you know, on live stream because I, I do want to hear what everyone has to say. So I just, I just wanted to tell you that. But um, as far as the compromise, uh, I am in favor of the compromise and I just want to just tell you a little bit about my thought process. I joined um, the board about a year ago, and within a month, I think about a month of joining the board, I was you know, voting on the start time issue. And um, so while I'd followed the board's actions you know, on the issue, and you know, I still had a lot to learn to understand the issue and decide my vote. And so, so when I, you know, I did a great deal of research and of course listened a great deal to the community, um, it was still like a, a torturous decision for me. Um, I felt strongly there were you know, clear benefits for teenagers to get more sleep, uh, while understanding it was a huge <coughs> change you know, for our families, uh, for both the K to five families and for our six to 12 families. Um, I did vote yes, but with the hope that with the bus audit, we'd find ourselves with times closer to the desired 8.30 start time. And, um, and I had faith that we would find ourselves in the community would find solutions for some of the challenges that um, that were inherent in the chain in such a big change and I trusted all that I'd learned you know from my research about other communities that had made the change and it wasn't easy at first and there were you know a lot of community members who will be disappointed by the decision but after implementation um, it seemed in these case studies it did go pretty well and people found that they you know benefited from the change um, but unfortunately, this isn't kind of what's happening in Scarborough. The times did not not get closer to 8.30, and it became a really difficult issue in our town. And, um, you know, a lot of disagreements between people in town and, um, and a lot of, you know, just a toxic environment. And so about a month and a half ago, I um, began to feel like maybe this was not just normal growing pains when a town is is making a decision it it felt to me that um, it was too much and so um, and I, I just want you to let you know I've, I've read all of your emails I've listened to, to you know all everything and I and believe me I do feel badly that for those that um, the late start plan would hurt some families I feel badly for that and then I also feel badly for families that, you know, really would like to have those late start, and that would really help their family. And um, so, so there is, you know, it comes down to there is no easy answer, but for me, um, seeing members of our community, you know, hurting, hurting each other, and it's just too much, and I feel, you know, the best option is to vote the compromise. But I do wish our teenagers could get more sleep um, I believe in the science, I know it would make a difference, and I value, you know, the professional judgment of our K-5 to teachers who feel that, you know, the K-5 to students would benefit from starting earlier as well. Um, but I cannot, in um, good conscience, allow our town to keep devolving into this kind of pit of negativity. And, um, and so um, I just um, want to make it clear that I, I I always want to hear from different viewpoints, and I'm perfectly okay if we disagree, but, but I just want to always remember that we're all neighbors, and we're on the same side, and um, we all want what's best for our students. And so, so lastly, I just know it hasn't been easy for all of us this last month, but, and I know we're all working to make it better, and, and I hope we can all remember that our children are watching and learning from us, and we remember who we are as a community. Yeah. Jody, can I add one more thing? Yes. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the bus audit and our hopes, our hopes that we had had for this plan. And I want the community to know that we hadn't just dug in our heels and said, nope, that's it, absolutely. The superintendent can 
<laughs> attest to the fact that we were constantly saying, what about this, what about that? We were always looking for ways to improve those K-5 bus times, always looking for ways to get the high school, middle school starting a little bit earlier. We were really hopeful about many different things that we could do around that. We hadn't just washed our hands of it. We were really work actively working all the time to try to find ways to improve the plan as it was set. Um, and then I, the other thing I wanted to talk about was just a little bit about the um, outcomes. A speaker on Monday night spoke about the outcomes. And so that kind of framed my way of thinking about the compromise plan versus sticking with um, the plan as it as we had planned on. Um, and I think that for me, I see the, one of the biggest um, outcomes of the compromise plan is the moving from the three-tier busing to the two-tier busing and the gain in instructional time that we might see as a result of that. And also that if we were to revisit this at some point in the future, um, that we would already have that part of the puzzle solved um, and it would be one less thing on the table of, of worries about um, how that two-tier busing looked, about um, efficiencies that could be found in it. This would give us a chance to find those kinds of efficiencies. Um, and of course, uh, you know, keeping the high school schedule the same with A East where it is and all of those things are that the positive outcomes I see from the compromise plan. Um, of course, I think that the positive outcomes that we could see from starting the adolescents after 8.30 and starting the K-5 kids a little earlier. Obviously, from the way I've voted in the past, I felt really strongly about those as well. So that's all. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'll go. And then I also have a statement from um, Donna Bealey, uh, who's not here tonight. So um, as you can see from the discussion with the board, it's there's no easy solution and I think um, in my talks with with a couple of you over the last week I have said it's okay to say that and to acknowledge that and to um, really think about what is best for our students and it sort of comes back to that all the time and so for me I fully supported the and and still do fully support the um, proposal that we approved last year um, but what I heard Monday night and I can't remember if it was Diane or who spoke um, struck me about and, and Mary just said it more eloquent eloquently than I can say but struck me about our kids and and what are they seeing and currently the the environment in this town is such that we're doing more harm for our kids than necessary and I think that for me the benefits of that later um, start time and for the high schoolers and and frankly I'm okay with an 8 a.m. start time for the younger kids I think that's age appropriate um, but the discourse that that has created in this town is is too much for our kids to have to <coughs> handle. And so for me, I'm willing to to support the amendment. Um, but it's it's completely unfortunate because I I think we had a huge opportunity to to serve to serve our children and to do something that was going to be positive for them and where um, we're failing. I, I feel like it. Um, they're the ones that are going to lose out on this. So I will support the amendment tonight. Um, but I think we need to all take a breath and, and look around us and be grateful for where we are and, and the town that we live in and the things that um, we are afforded here. So. Um, Having said that, I will also read Donna's statement just so it gets on record. Dear school board colleagues and Dr. Kuchenberger, I am sorry to be away at such a very busy time for the board. However, I do want to offer my thoughts on your upcoming decisions this evening. In October of 2015, the board, along with several other school boards, was invited to a meeting in Saco to hear from several physicians about the research on sleep deprivation and the impact on middle and high school students nationwide. The research was and continues to be undeniable and it is promoted by all the major medical organizations I know of. 
What was clear to me that evening was that the benefits of changing school starts would not take effect unless students did not start school be high school students did not start school before 8:30. Since that evening, the board has been on a journey to help staff and family, families understand the huge body of knowledge that supports that change. Unfortunately, in Scarborough, this plan could not work well without the addition of several buses or drivers or outsourcing busing at significant costs. Like my fellow board members, my focus continues to be on the health and safety and most optimal learning environments for all of our students. After numerous meetings and many discussions, emails, staff, and parent meetings, it is clear that some kind of compromise or pause in the process must occur as recommended by our superintendent at the last board meeting. Although I cannot be there this evening, I will support the will of the board. I want to praise you for your endless hours of volunteer work you have done on this topic, past board members, as well as our staff, director of transportation, our athletic director, our current and past superintendents, and, and our assistant superintendent, Joanne Sizemore. Respectfully, Donna Beatley. Um, so I'll submit that for record. Um, does anyone else have anything they would like to <coughs> add? Thomas. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, throughout the public comment and throughout all this time, the thing that I most, uh, one of the most common things I heard was regarding science. And uh, I think that it's very good that people talk about science and how it can be implemented in policy. I don't think that it's good necessarily uh, if it fosters distrust in science. Uh, but I think that the viewpoint that people should have is not that as much uh, in terms of uh, perspective of science on this decision, uh, on this compromise, but rather in terms of economics. You only have so many hours in a day. You only have 24. And you gotta figure out how to you know, divide that time up because it's a scarce resource. Uh, and uh, the most rational way of doing that, I think, is a way that works most harmonious with people's schedules, and I think that's the that's a compromise uh, more than anything else. Uh, so uh, I think that it should just be looked at from a different perspective. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to say that for the last few months, I've noticed and everyone has that this late start issue has been huge among both the town but in the schools itself high schoolers from all grades have contacted me and have been talking for months about how they shouldn't be changing it we shouldn't be changing it but after monday when they heard that a compromise was even an option the whole argument that 735 is the only time we could ever go to school like ever was changed to eight o'clock could be the perfect time for us. <laughs> so, just wait till they see here eight thirty. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just like to say that I think that this eight o'clock start time will not only improve the climate of the schools, but it's going to benefit the students because they know no longer have to worry about their schedule being changed both in and outside of school, and they can still get a little bit of extra sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Anybody else have any more comments before we vote on the amendment? Okay. All in favor of Jackie's amendment? Seven. Plus two. Um, so now back to the main motion. Six, 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 oh, sorry. Donna. Oh, Donna. Six plus two. Sorry. Wait. Um, back to the main motion with this amendment. Is that how it would go back? Well. It's just moved. The amendment has overshadowed the okay. original, so. Fair. And did anybody else have any other amendments other than that one? Yes, okay. I have. Okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, I would uh, make a motion to suspend the school board uh, policy BG in order to hold a special school board meeting. I was going to suggest March 22nd, 2018, for second reading and action on ID-R to allow the community ample time to plan. In other words, to move up the second reading uh, 
so it doesn't go into the month of April. But after I heard about the teachers, uh, I'm I'm not certain that, that that would be a good idea. That Kelly didn't think a week would be enough time. Do you think two weeks would be enough time? I do, March but I know I, the reason why I bring up the week, two weeks thing is that I, I don't know if the board meeting always has to be on a Thursday because there's already a big event on the Thursday. Right. So. And it could be it could be a different night. Mm -hmm. Well, would it be too late to just keep it at the April 5th meeting? That's three weeks. Think for community services yeah, it seem, that seems far away three the weeks. challenge with that is then setting staff schedules because the principals do have to go back to staff once the second reading happens to fig to reconfigure meeting times because high school and middle school is going to meet before the start of the school day and that obviously i don't think would be an option at this point first teachers would be meeting at like six in the morning <laughs> um, and k-5 may want to consider before school meetings where before that wasn't an option for them and community service, I think. And and community services. So a lot of families have already uh, pre-registered for child care. And so obviously this shifts you may need now before care and not after care or vice versa. Um, so we want to also be sensitive to that planning piece for families and community services. I don't mean to be a driver in, in this, but I, I would be much more comfortable with something the week of March 26th, giving at least the full week next week and a bit into the following week so that we have an opportunity to talk with our staff. March Did we answer whether it does have to be on a Thursday? It doesn't have to be on a Thursday. Oh, it's, it's, special special it's just about having space. Oh, that's right. Because it's a three days ago. Okay. Okay. So what if we left it that the special meeting would be the week of the 26th and charge the superintendent with finding a space um, and a date that works for all of us? Okay. The 29th is out because there's another school event Unless that Unless you were to do it at like 5... Joe, but I think I think that I think in, uh, it's better if we can hold it on a Thursday, which is a regular personal opinion now, a regular day. So l let me do this. Let me put in uh, a special school board meeting on Thursday, March 29th, as as my motion. And then we can amend the motion Got to it. a different date. But to get the motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So, discussion. The, the motion is to do it on <coughs> March 29th. And we can discuss that. Our discussion now is that we can't do it on March 29th. <laughs> um, well, just you, in the interest of what Kelly's saying, it, but not at right. 7 o'clock at 9. Right. So we could either do it earlier or, but I would hate to have it on like a Monday or Tuesday because that's really giving you only a week and you you were pretty clear that a week really wasn't enough time. And I don't, I'm, so I what don't about Wednesday the 28th? Miss what teachers that, you know, I don't know. Is that the same? Does it matter if it's is is, this, is the council meet? Then? No, no. Okay. There's an event. I'm so, I'm so sorry, but there's an incoming third grade parent night. I can't um, hear you. Excuse me. There's incoming third grade parent night at Wentworth on the 28th. What time is that at? Um, six o'clock. And how long does that last? It's about an hour. So um, maybe seven o'clock. Seven thirty. That's all. Seven just, if we're going to use the. Oh, if we were going to use why Wentworth. Would, why, would we, why would we not have the meeting here? Well, I just didn't know if we needed to. We don't know if this room is even available. We have to. Tuesday. We have to find out. Julie, I've asked Julie to find out when rooms are available. We have to find out space, our schedules. Can we do that as. as okay. I can do that as soon as tomorrow. I just can't do that right, right now. I know that. Yeah. I know that. So I think. So I'll change my motion to a special it. school board meeting the week of March 26th. Right. right. To de be determined by the availability of space. Yes. Yeah. That would be preferred. Okay. So is everybody okay with that mm -hmm. sort of framework? Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow we'll go back. Yeah. With more, and then we'll post it online um, and get so your homework count. is to find out from your staff what they are going to think, and then 
let us know. Okay, so all in favor of the motion for um, a special meeting the week of March 26th. Six plus two. Thank you. Okay, moving on to 7.2. Um, I, the most interesting the I'm going to, I think we should just accept them all, or do them all together if someone wants to make a motion. I move that we accept the meeting minutes of January 8th, January 18th, and February 1st. Second. Do anyone have any changes, any edits? All in favor? Six plus two. Thank you. And then appointments 8.0, 8.1, high school winter spring strength coaches. Approval is printed. Second. Do you want to read them? I can read them. 12.1 um, is Jonathan Bus Esteem as the winter strength coach to be, pay, um, to be paid out of the general fund, and Lance Johnson as a winter spring strength coach to be paid out of the general fund. Do you have a question on that? Sure. Is that called Bastion? I think the name is Bastion. Did I spell uh, it Yeah, B A S T I A N. Yeah. I -A -N. Yes, I -A -N. Okay. I'm sorry, Jonathan, for mispronouncing your name. I didn't know if that was material. All in favor? Six plus two. And so 9.0 is the motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056D for the purpose of discussing the Scarborough Administrator's contract not to return to public session. So moved. Second. All in favor? 6.6 plus 2. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Oh, uh, we'll need a motion to adjourn for oh. after our executive session. What's that? Okay, I move to adjourn after our executive session. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Okay, good. All in favor.